Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome wherever you are in the world. Let's start. Welcome to I3D 2021, the ACM SIGGRAPH Symposium on Interactive 3D Graphics and Games. My name is Ulf Assarsson, and I have the pleasure of saying the first few words, but I will hand it over to the rest of the I3D committee in a minute. Here you see this year's committee, Ari Silvenoin and I, we are the general chairs, and I have to say that the lion's share of all hard work behind organizing this year's conference has been done by our helping chair members. John Cassas and Eric Haynes are the paper's chairs. They have been in charge of selecting the final accepted papers out of all great submissions. And they have also helped us tremendously in the overall organization of this online conference. Christoph Peters is the poster's chair and has done a wonderful job so that we can use the same kind of virtual space for the poster presentation as last year. Don't miss that. He will tell you more in a few minutes. The program chairs Stravko Velenov and Maurizio Vives are our studio magicians, and they are behind managing the teleconference and studio system, the live streaming to YouTube, assisting and directing the speakers and presenters, orchestrating the Discord channel where you can ask all the questions related to the presentations, and they also put together the I3D preview video, which is available on the homepage. And this is just to mention a few of the things they have done. Finally, our publicity chair is Ari Rakin Blankhorn, who has been with us for five years. Her work includes uh, acting as a webmaster, handling social media, mailing lists, the Twitter account, Facebook page, the i3 homepage, and all sorts of contacts. We cannot thank her enough for that invaluable work and commitment, and also for knowing how to fix things when the rest of us were clueless. Our lead sponsor and platinum sponsor is Unreal Engine and the people at Epic. Since uh, I3D was online, uh, an online conference last year and is an online conference this year, we have managed to keep the I3 expenses down to virtually zero. And practically all sponsors were kind enough to let us roll over their funding contributions uh, to the next year when I3 hopefully goes back to a real life conference again. We thank them for that. Our gold sponsors are Unity, The Forge, Arm, Intel, Facebook, Disney Research, Google, and Huawei. And finally, our silver sponsors are AMD, Activision, and NVIDIA. Here, you can see the attendance numbers for the last decade. It has been fluctuating around 100 attendees from 2012 to 2019. But as you can see, having the conference go virtual last year naturally boosted the attendance numbers up to around 500 registered participants. Well, nevertheless, I think we're all longing for the possibility to see each other in person at the real life conference, and hopefully that will be possible next year. Let's see if there is a way to combine the best of both worlds. Right now, as for a few moments ago, we reached 429 registrations and we want more, so please register, it's free. We also have awards. We have two best paper awards and one best student poster presentation award, and they will get prizes too. NVIDIA donates a GeForce 3090 RTX, Facebook is donating one of their headsets, and AMD is donating one of their high-end WX cards. The winners will be announced on the closing and award session on Thursday at 1.15 p.m. Now I will hand over to my co-chair, Ari Silvenoinen. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. So this year, the conference takes place over three days, each day starting with the keynote, followed by technical paper sessions and ending with a special session and a social event. The full program with links to the papers as well as the free registration link can be found on the I3D website. After you have registered to the conference, you have access to our Discord server where you will find channels for each paper session and the keynotes. The important point here is that you're able to participate in the sessions by simply asking questions in the Discord channels and you can do this at any time during the conference. The session moderators will follow the Discord channels and the speakers will answer your questions at the end of each paper or keynote session during a live Q&A panel. And registration also gives you full access to social events as well as uh, special sessions like Town Hall later today and the interactive poster session tomorrow. And in addition to papers, posters, and social events, we have three exciting keynotes this year. Today, right after this opening session, Peter Pike Sloan from Activision 
will reflect on his experiences with interactive rendering and games over the last three decades. Tomorrow, we'll start the day with Paul Diaz from Tactual Labs, who will be talking about shape sensing and how this could enable highly expressive user interfaces. Finally, on Thursday, we have Colin Barre Brispois from Seed Electronic Arts talking about the state of ray tracing in video games now and in the future. And with that, I'll hand off to Eric and Dan to talk about the papers program. Hello. Uh, thanks, Ari. Hello, my name is Dan Casas, and together with Eric Heinz, we have served as paper chairs for I3D 2021. First, uh, first and most importantly, we would like to thank all the amazing members of the community who helped us put together this program by reviewing the papers. This year, the paper, the program committee consisted of 38 members across a variety of industry and academia. When setting up the committee, we put a special emphasis on inviting new people who, even if they were actively working on the field of uh, interactive 3D graphics, they did not serve as a PC members for i3D before. We hope this refreshed list of PC members can contribute to enhance and grow the i3D community. We thank them deeply for their dedication and help to evaluate the submitted papers. And speaking of submissions, this year we had 34 submissions. This is a relatively significant decrease over the previous year. For example, in, in 2020, we had 60. And we believe the current crisis due to COVID-19 might have affected the number of submissions. Nevertheless, we are happy to see that the quality standards of the 16 accepted submissions are comparable or even higher than previous years. Accepted papers have emphasis on a variety of topics, including real-time rendering, virtual reality, example-based animation, and 3D reconstruction, among other exciting fields in, 3D, in computer graphics. It is particularly interesting to see that well-established areas such as real-time ray tracing or our physically based fluid simulations are combined with emerging trends in machine learning to improve the state of the art. Also new this year, all accepted papers appear in the journal Proceedings of ACM in Computer Graphics and Interactive Techniques. Notice that papers are still not available in the ACM digital library, but you can download them from the direct links we put in the conference website. So in addition to the 16 accepted papers, our program also includes a number of invited papers. Two from uh, IEEE TVCG, and five from Journal of Computer, Journal of Graphics Tools, known as JCGT. Presentations will consist on paper, on paper sessions where each paper will be presented in a 15 minute pre recorded talks, following by 10 to 15 minutes live Q and A's with authors of the papers presented in the sessions. Remember that you can post questions in the Discord server or in the live chat of the YouTube stream. Now I will hand over to my co chair, Eric Heinz. Thanks, Dan. So you'll notice that there are papers from other journals. Uh, first of all, there is IEEE Transactions on Visualization and Computer Graphics, TVCG for short. They have a few papers presented at I3D this year. Conferences such as I3D are a chance for researchers to quickly get their papers out to the public, since there's a strict deadline and limited time for revisions. As important, presentations give authors an opportunity to meet their peers and get feedback. I3D is a small enough conference that we can experiment with different ways in which journal articles can be presented. Towards this end, the past few years, we've invited TVCG authors to present their work. The Journal of Computer Graphics Techniques is the other journal whose authors we invite to present their work at I3D. This open access journal focuses on practical techniques and often provides code and other resources. It's now in its 10th year. Each day of I3D is followed by some social activity. After the town hall this afternoon, evening, or morning, depending where you are, we'll have a little meetup at this virtual rooftop bar using a free program called Gather. You have to provide your own drinks. All you need to do is to go to the link provided on the social channel at that time. Also, if you know you're going to attend, please go visit the social channel sometime today in advance and let us know in case we need to book a larger space. No, I'm not kidding. Note that this is the Symposium on Interactive 3D Graphics and Games. 
Immediately following the posters on Wednesday and awards on Thursday, we're having some social gaming. If you plan on attending, please prepare in advance. It's all free and let us know on the social channel that you're planning to attend. I'm going to hand the presentation to Ari rapkin Blankhorn, our longstanding publicity chair, serving since 2017. Hi, everybody. Welcome to I3D 2021. I'm the social media chair, which as you heard earlier, means that I'm the person behind the Twitter and Facebook accounts, the mailing list, the website, and a number of other um, media and uh, digital communications channels that help make all of this stuff go. We encourage you to post or tweet your thoughts about I3D during the conference. In a normal year, we'd be encouraging you to post your photos from the conference, but for this year, well, if you wanna post selfies with your pets, helping you watch the video stream from home, we'd love to see them. Please remember to use the I3D 2021 hashtag. Next slide, please. Okay, while this year's conference is virtual, so some of ACM's event policy against discrimination and harassment doesn't apply, we will have a number of ways to interact with the speakers and with each other. We have chat channels for presentation discussion on Discord, we'll have the poster session in a virtual reality setting, and we'll have our town hall meeting. So we ask that you take a moment to read over this policy and take it to heart. If you see or are the recipient of any harassment, please report it to us immediately. You can message us on Discord or email general at i3dsymposium.org. Next, please. Harassment does not require intent to offend. A joke or even a compliment can be a problem. So please just think twice and take other people's responses seriously. Thank you for helping to make I3D a pleasant and safe experience for everyone. And now I'll hand off to Christoph Peters, our posters chair. Thank you, Ari. And as posters chair, I also want to welcome you to this year's I3D conference. We have an exciting program of five original posters. And in addition, our poster session will feature five live demos of I3D papers. You can find a list of all of them on our website. And in a minute, there will be a fast forward giving you a preview of the posters. Then tomorrow at 12.15 Pacific Daylight Time, we will have our virtual posters and demos session. This session will be hosted in a virtual reality space on Mozilla Hubs. You can walk around and go talk to all the poster and paper authors as you would at a physical conference. The Mozilla Hub is already open now, so you can already check out the posters. The link is in the posters Discord channel. If you like, you can use a head mounted display, but any browser will do, even on mobile devices. We will also stream poster presentations to YouTube. And now it is time for the fast forwards, featuring all five posters. Linearly transformed spherical harmonics are an extension to linearly transformed cosines. LTC approximates specular BRDFs in a way that enables efficient shading for Lambertian polygonal area lights by applying a linear transformation M to the clamped cosine function. We instead use more versatile spherical harmonic expansions to achieve better approximations, especially at grazing angle. The quality of our technique is adjustable through the degree of the spherical harmonic expansion. We improve image quality compared to LTC at higher cost. Our proof-of-concept implementation is able to produce appealing real-time renderings with direct illumination from polygonal area lights. We are looking forward to seeing you at the virtual poster session. We present MMPX, an efficient filter for upscaling pixel art assets akin to 8-bit and 16-bit era video games. The primary goal of our method is to produce results similar to an artist redrawing upscaled pixel art assets by hand. Preserving this art style during upscaling includes ensuring important features are preserved, rounding edges when necessary, and avoiding introducing new colors to represent characteristic hardware limitations of the consoles where pixel art was first introduced. We compare our method against various image upscaling techniques, including HQX and XBR, and measure their runtime performance. To learn more about how the algorithm works and how MMPX fared, please visit our virtual booth during the poster presentation session.
We describe our system for computing kinematic metrics from videos of sign language speakers. The goal of these metrics is to quantify the articulatory effort required to make different signs. Most sign language datasets are based on video. Usually, fluent speakers need to transcribe and annotate these datasets manually. However, recent advances in computer vision give us an opportunity to automate parts of this process. Furthermore, we can measure quantities that would have been prohibitively difficult to measure before. This set of plots shows how several metrics vary over time. These metrics are lowest when both hands are resting in the lap. Highest values correspond to frames with large acceleration. These are preliminary steps for an ongoing project. Come by our poster if you'd like to chat more about motion analysis and physically based character animation. Decals allow us to blend textures onto objects inside a box-shaped projection volume. In deferred shading, decals can be applied to the G-buffer by rasterizing the box geometry. We present an approach that works independent of the underlying render technique and handles decals in ray traced reflections. Our method uses ray tracing acceleration structures to enumerate decals for each shading point. By using a zero length ray from the shading position, we intersect axis aligned bounding boxes of all overlapping decals. We also use this technique to enumerate local light sources. Overall, our method presents a viable alternative in cases where deferred decals are not applicable. Thank you for listening and I hope to meet you at the poster session. Hey, I'm Paula. Let me introduce you to our technique, rendering of many lights with grid-based reservoirs or re-gear in short. This technique can be used to speed up light sampling when raising secondary rays or rendering any other effect that needs light information outside of the view frustum. The idea of our technique is that we create a simple grid around a camera and fill it with light samples using a resampling process. This grid is fast to fill and access. If you are eager to know a little bit more details about our technique, come to check our poster. Okay, so it's time to get this conference started and I'm happy to introduce our first keynote speaker, Peter Pike Sloan from Activision. Peter Pike is a technical fellow at Activision and currently leads a graphics research group in Redmond, Washington. Prior to joining Activision, he has worked at NVIDIA, Disney, Microsoft, Parametric Technology and Evans and Sutherland. Over the last three decades, Peter Pike has worked in multiple areas of game technology and published papers in animation, scheming simulation, and interactive rendering, in addition to working on some of the biggest gaming franchises in the world, like Destiny and Call of Duty. And today, in the first keynote of the conference, Peter Pike will talk about the evolution of interactive rendering and reflects on his experiences along the way as a practitioner and as a researcher. Take it away, Peter Pike. Thanks, Ari. So uh, I have a long and fond history with I3D. This is actually where my first uh, conference presentation was at a paper in 97. Unfortunately, that presentation um, wasn't a, a great experience in that um, I had to switch AV from, I think, a demo Michael Cohen was doing on a reality engine to my slide, my most complicated slide, and the AV switcher didn't work. So figuring out how to run uh, uh, AV switchers and projection is still an open research problem for people looking for that. So my paper was on image-based rendering and modeling, which was really big at the time. And then I, my impression is it kind of waned in graphics. And I think it's pretty big again now, if you look at photogrammetry and various forms of ML-assisted rendering, these neural rendering papers and things. Um, it's also worth pointing out that the conference landscape was very different uh, in, in this time. So EGSR was called the workshop on rendering instead of uh, what we know of EGSR as now. And essentially all the papers had Monte Carlo or finite element in the title. Um, SCA was created in 2002 and SGP in 2003, so those communities were more present at I3D and SIGGRAPH wasn't uh, as, didn't have as much interactive content, so it was a place to go for interactive things and was held every other year, and, and I have fond memories of, of those early years. So when thinking about uh, what to do, um, I didn't want to look forward, so I've had a couple of times in my career, um, both on the SIGGRAPH Executive Committee and at Activision, where we've had these meetings where we look 10 years in the future or whatever, and I gradually went along, but my 
point I made raised both times um, was if you look back 10 years uh, in those exercises, something disruptive would occur that you wouldn't have predicted. So it seems like being nimble is better. Uh, for SIGGRAPH, I believe our meeting was December 2019, uh, talking about what conferences in SIGGRAPH would be like in 2030, and then COVID hits, and of course, everything is completely different. Um, uh, and for Activision, it was, it was similar. Um, you don't have to look back 10 years. If you look back two years, uh, you would think that, you know, it's not feasible for someone to give a keynote talk not wearing pants, but that could happen today. So I decided to sort of look over my career and do this fast backwards. So this name comes from, I think Don Greenberg had talked about this and I've talked with Turner about it before. Um, I wanna preface this with, this is my very biased perspective on my career. So I've been doing interactive graphics since about 92 or 93 um, and things have changed a lot, um, but this is by no means, this is my own potentially faulty memories and other people have different takes that so don't overfit to anything I say. So I started getting paid, I think it was 92 or 93. Um, uh, there's a lot that happened before then. So uh, there was the assembly programming where you set up these bias interrupts and you map um, the frame buffer to the memory address space. And I did a little bit of this, but I was, it, wasn't, it wasn't serious. Uh, flight simulation hardware has existed since the 60s, at least, I think. Um, but again, that was very different. It was very BSP centric instead of what we think of today as, as, as graphic acceleration. Um, there was an API that I affordably, you know, I, I luckily dodged, which was these retain mode APIs. So there was FIGS and PEX, which stands for FIGS extensions X. I have a good friend, Ray Jones. He probably still wakes up in a cold sweat, uh, having had to implement the drivers for this um, on Evans Sutherland hardware. Um, and OpenGL had just come into, into play. So IrisGL had existed. OpenGL uh, was 92, and I'm really going to start in 93 in my career. Um, uh, one thing to point out is, my understanding is the old Iris GL was actually a very thin abstraction to the hardware. So when you did GL vertex or whatever, it poked registers that went right to the graphics processor. So it wasn't this uh, batch up all kinds of stuff and then submit it later like we have today. So, so the gap between APIs and hardware has evolved uh, um, uh, over time. So I worked at ENS in 1993, but not the part of ENS that everyone uh, knows about. So they're famous for these flight simulators they actually had a couple of other efforts that weren't very successful. I think they started a supercomputer well before my time and they made a workstation. Um, when I joined, I think that workstation had already failed and they were selling graphics cards. So big high-end graphics boxes. You can see a picture here. Rich Thompson has a collection of um, artifacts and computer graphics history. Um, and uh, uh, these graphics accelerators, um, I wrote tests and benchmarks. They were mostly written during OpenGL, uh, Sun and HP uh, um, uh, would resell them. And I wrote a morphing demo that would show at SIGGRAPH and other things as well. And it was, it was a really fun time um, and a really good experience uh, for me. This is, I think, summer 93 is when I started. Um, uh, and one thing that was obvious at the time for me was this API alignment to hardware. So uh, our hardware was this big box that was off uh, from the workstation. So we used OpenGL display list at the time to try and gather stuff up and submit it over. The sort of semi-retained mode style programming where you have resources that are living on a graphics hardware and you manage that came in the APIs much later in DirectX and, and OpenGL. But and I did all my coding in OpenGL at the time. Uh, that's what, what I used through the, the late 90s. So at the same time, there was a lot of excitement in software rendering, and I'll touch on my connection with this in a bit. Um, and I want to use sort of the notion of Pareto optimality or the Pareto frontier to describe this. So this is a 2D graph where you have on the horizontal axis. Uh, is quality. This will just be some abstract thing. Don't don't uh, think too hard about it. And performance, and we'll look at it in the units of time, milliseconds. So you want to be in the lower right corner of the graph. And if you um, uh, uh, there's a there's a great YouTube video from Handmade Conference 2016 on the history of software texture mapping in games. And so if you're interested in those early days from the late 80s through the early 90s and and uh, uh, what happened in the game industry then, I think I would strongly encourage you to to look at that. I'm only going to briefly touch on it here. So some of the first 3D games um, uh, had lots of constraints and, and you know, the PC hardware at the time was very limited. This was all purely software code. They were generally written in C with some assembly language interloops for, for your things like texture mapping. Um, uh, Wolfenstein 3D, the camera couldn't tilt up and down and it only would rotate in 90 degree increments. So this made uh, perspective correction really simple. It was only on the, on the walls. Um, Ultima Underworld was a much more general engine. It was a little slower at the time just because hardware was slower. Chris Green worked on this and some of the titles I'll talk about later. Um, uh, and then Doom, of course, everyone knows. And this, this essentially had also no camera tilt and did, did um, uh, texture mapping on the walls and floors. Um, and a big thing that got performance on these early, early uh, games was 
offline pre-processing. So in Doom in particular, you would do this BSP compile step that was sort of 2D. Um, the next set of PC games came out um, uh, and I actually left, I was on Sutherland in 94, I think it was summer of 94. And I joined a game startup uh, run by a guy named Bruce Johnson who worked uh, prior to that on Axis Software. And so Under a Killing Moon is one of the first general 3D engines. This was a point and click adventure game that had general texture mapping. And the way this worked and at least this particular engine was it was assembly language, but you couldn't afford to do the perspective divide every pixel. Uh, the latency was too long, it would be too expensive. So you would essentially do it every nth pixel or n was eight or something like this. Um, System Shock and Quake are other sort of popular, more performant games that came at the time. And as people got better, they optimized these. And this YouTube video, I think, talks about how they got it down to only a handful of cycles. Um, uh, so, so, so I think the software rendering in video games uh, was, was a really exciting time. And, and it was amazing what people could do. Um, uh, and in particular, you only had so many clocks per pixel. Like you, you know, and, and I would say there was even more effort spent in only ever drawing a pixel once than there was in the inner loops of these, these texture mapping algorithms through offline compilation and things. So on the Pareto front, uh, you kind of move in performance for free. Hardware gets faster, clock rates get higher, instruction latencies get lower. The floating point performance got a lot better on the Pentium than it was in the 486. Uh, you got floating point on the 486 where you didn't have it in the, in the 3D6. And these games use mixed integer and floating point anyways. Um, but moving uh, uh, in quality is hard. And one way to do this, one way to sort of time travel, if you will, is to apply constraints. These camera constraints are examples, but also the, the, these engines actually are closer to the flight simulator style architectures that are essentially doing lots of work to only ever draw pixels once and, and dealing with visibility, not with a Z buffer, but with with some kind of polygon sorting or, or, or uh, BSP processing. And you also had to simplify things. So lighting was often baked and materials were simpler. Um, I think an interesting you know, anecdote about this time travel is we recently had sort of Quake released with real-time global illumination. So you can think of 20 years later, we essentially took a, a game and you could see this is a dim reflection of what you'd be able to do in 20 years by pre-computing all the, all the indirect lighting in, in that game. Um, one thing that maybe isn't super obvious is when you want to advance in quality, all of these optimizations that are done to get you to the Pareto front kind of paint you in a corner. So you have all these scene constraints and other things mean making things more flexible can be more difficult. It can be easier to move from a, a sort of less uh, constrained uh, solution that maybe isn't on the front um, to advance to the right than, than not. And I'll, I'll bring this up later when I talk about um, where we are today with games. So I only worked at this little game startup for, I think it was about six months. In the fall of 94, I went back to Evans and Sutherland, but in a different division. So I worked on what turned out to be the first uh, commercial 3D painting application. And this is interesting because in 94, this only ran on SGI reality engines, which were these amazing architectures um, uh, that had incredible performance. Nothing else was really close uh, to them at the time. Um, and we only had one customer that I was aware of, which was Ford Motor Company, and they would buy 80 seats. And software, like this kind of software was $40,000 a seat or something ridiculous like this. And so we had one of these SGI reality engines and we had other workstations. And the workstation you worked on, even the non-reality engine was some integer multiple of your salary. Uh, this is a, a scan of a cover for Martin Cole, someone who worked with me actually at both of these places, the game startup and later PTC, PTC acquired us in, in uh, 95. Um, and so here's an example of 3D painting. You have a sphere and you have a red stroke. And the way we did this um, on these SGI hardware was essentially a form of deferred rendering where we'd render out a G buffer. So lighting layers, specular and diffuse were separate because you would multiply albedo by diffuse and add specular. Um, and then we'd also render out some normals and other things. And then the act of painting for us was um, essentially you're painting on a sheet of glass in a fixed camera and you're using compositing math to essentially update these dots the SGI hardware had 12-bit frame buffers at the time. So like the, this became an issue when we moved to software later. Um, and then if you want to rotate the camera, we did what amounts to a shadow map step where you essentially render into texture space using a depth test based on this sheet of glass uh, to know when to blend in the, the textures. And you update the base albedo and you repeat the process. Um, I think this is relevant because the, we, the industry went from like crazy high-end SGI only hardware to do this type of, uh, of, of uh, software to by the end of the 90s, this could just be done on a commodity machine all in software. So, so the, the ubiquity of 3D graphics really you know, you know, went, went, went through the roof and in all aspects. And this is in sort of heavy offline stuff, not, not, not games. Games were evolving at the same time as well. Um, 
So I also was a student at the University of Utah, and there we had, um, uh, and Chris Johnson is my, was my PhD advisor. I started uh, grad school in 96. Um, we had this super crazy machine. Um, it was a SGI reality monster. It had 32 CPUs. That's not cores. You couldn't put more than one core on a die at the time. Um, and eight of these infinite reality engine pipes. Um, and these, again, were amazing machines. They had, um, they didn't just have like, like memory wasn't fast enough to sort of just have one bank of memory like and one wide bus like we do today. You had this distributed uh, chips and processing across multiple boards in each of these things. The texture memory itself was repeated so that you could fetch, you know, different uh, samples would be from different banks of RAM and things like this to get performance. It had things like bicubic texture filtering that still isn't in hardware today um, in, in, a, in a general way. And we had a couple of papers on this. I think uh, one, one thing that was interesting is I think this use of crazy CPU counts, we kind of got more out of than, than these eight, eight graphics heads. I have one paper, uh, this image-based rendering paper on the bottom where I did both the software and hardware reconstruction where I would render using all of these eight uh, uh, infinite reality engines and then composite the data in software. Um, and again, that was mostly just getting more texture memory was, was the win in these image-based rendering applications. Um, one other thing that was interesting, so this machine cost millions of dollars, Work from home was not feasible at this time. You know, modems were too slow. Any kind of remote desktop was, was, was terrible. So you had to go in the lab. So the lab culture, I think, was really great. And I, I really enjoyed my time in, in grad school in Utah. Um, and so these SGI machines, again, you wire up these state machines and, and run these things. That was sort of the, the old school OpenGL is how you, you program these. Um, at the same time, uh, so this is like mid-90s. So, um, oh, actually, I'll, I'll go over some SGI stuff more. So we had two papers at I3D in 99. Um, one was using this interactive ray tracing. So this was Steve Parker did most of the work. I did some frameless rendering. So this is just using the CPUs of this big computer. Um, and the other was sort of traditional multi-pass, uh, you know, SGI style uh, rendering to do technical illustration with the Gucci's um, where you could render lines of different thicknesses based on how illustrators did things. Um, uh, you would do multi-pass shadow algorithms and things like this. Uh, there was a data structure finding silhouettes and meshes uh, that I think was one of the earlier ones. They're much better ones uh, since this paper. I think to me, the two quintessential um, SGI OpenGL multi-pass rendering papers um, from this, this era in the 90s, um, one was at I3D in 97 by Diffenbach and this multi-pass pipeline rendering. So they could do glossy reflections and all kinds of things. This wasn't interactive. This was sort of, I think it was a couple seconds of frame, but they, they use multi-pass rendering to the fullest in this, in this work by, by Paul. Um, they could do, you know, here's, here's this, this image. And so shadow volumes and projective textures and all kinds of tricks with things like this. But there was no programmable shaders or anything like that. Uh, the other one was at SIGGRAPH in 98 by Rudiger Westerman um, on doing volume rendering and uh, uh, using graphics hardware. So there were these pixel texture extensions. The ISO service image is done by doing a forward difference to the light, you know, to get gradients and doing dot products with, with you know, crazy multi-pass uh, algorithms. Um, and there's another paper by uh, Wolfgang Heydrich, the following year in SIGGRAPH that I considered using here. But so I think this was sort of peak um, OpenGL multi-pass rendering. Um, the PC GPUs uh, were starting to come out in the late 90s, um, about the time these papers were out. Um, and uh, I think there's sort of this era of pre-shaders that wasn't, uh, looking back, I don't have that many fond memories. It was a pain to wire up for multi-texturing or these register combiners are essentially, uh, it's just, it's basically three instructions that were the pixel shader at the time and the GeForce 2, this is a slide from John Spitzer, but to specify those three instructions, you had to write probably two pages of code wiring up all these parameters in this API. I did this in this, my last paper that wasn't programmable shaders was this interactive horizon mapping paper where we took an algorithm that Nelson Max had come out for self shadowing of bump maps and we um, ran it on these in NVIDIA GPUs at the time. Um, and looking this up, I saw that uh, NVIDIA actually had NV parts, so a very early shading language for register combiners. I don't, I either didn't know about it or, or it came after I, I, I did my last work on this. Um, so then the next sort of wave of, of, of PCs uh, was programmable shaders. These really came out in the early 2000s. So the GeForce 3 was NVIDIA's part that first introduced as an ATI hardware as well. Um, the first round of this, you did everything in assembly language, which actually was really simple. The assembly language was clean. You couldn't do that much. The pixel shader, for example, was just eight instructions um, at that time. So the space of all eight instruction shaders just isn't that large. So it wasn't, it wasn't that hard to, to do this. Um, and then in 2002, sort of the DX9 and the more complete programmability started coming out. Um, so this is when HLSL and other shading languages became common. Uh, you could do texture lookups and vertex shaders. The pixel shader length went a lot longer, went to 64 instructions, I think, on that first generation of hardware. Um, and in 
the research community, this is when all the GPGPU papers came out. So Brooke Ian Buck's uh, a thesis work was one of the early stream processing things, and there was lots of exciting work uh, in, in, in this space at the time. So my next sort of uh, leap forward, I will go to um, uh, Direct 3D10. So there was a SIGGRAPH paper by David Blythe, who was my boss at the time, um, a systems paper on the D3D10 system. And I gave a keynote in the graphics hardware conference on D3D10 and some, some things looking a bit future. Um, and revisiting this, I think this was good. So OpenGL always had a really good specification, but uh, like what are rasterization rules, how much precision you have. Um, but Direct3D was a little wild west and, and much more all over the map. So they really cleaned this up in D3D10. Uh, we moved, started moving towards IEEE floating point. Um, one goal was to try and shrink this gap between abstraction and implementation. And PC games at the time, uh, CPU overheads were a big problem. Um, and, and if you compare it to consoles, for example, that were, were around this time, uh, where there is no abstraction, um, this was really noticeable. I think a bad is we didn't quite hit that abstraction. So while we probably improved over D3D9, there still was a gap. So we tried to group state and other things so that uh, hardware could update more efficiently. And there was a driver model change as well. But the reality was we didn't uh, close the, 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 the gap as much as maybe we would have liked. And unfortunately, there is what I consider an ugly. So uh, one of them is the DX11 thing, but I talked about it in the end of my keynote. Uh, the first is geometry shaders. So this is the idea of per primitive shaders. Seems like a reasonable idea. I think there are two sort of flaws with the way this rolled out. Uh, one big one was the performance was very different on different vendors. So it was hard to know if things worked well. And some vendors it was okay, and other vendors were, you know, it was, it was, it was terrible performance. So this performance variability was really problematic. The other problem was it was sort of designed around things like shadow volumes, which was a shadow algorithm that Frank Crow came up with in the 80s and was used in games. But by this time in 2006, I don't think anyone used them anymore. They had all kinds of precision problems and other things. So, so they just weren't very common. Um, so it sort of overfit. Uh, tessellation is more complicated. There's been tessellation in graphics hardware going back to SGI hardware for a long time. Uh, the DX11 one was an attempt to sort of make this programmable in a way with domain shaders and all these kinds of things. But again, I think there's pretty high variability among, among the vendors and things like the tessellation patterns were fixed functions. So a lot of times using compute shaders, uh, which would come uh, later, was just a better way to do, to do tessellation. So I think this is a, a bit of a, a swing and a miss as well. Maybe, maybe not as bad as geometry shaders though. Um, so then in the late 2000s, uh, compute shaders came out and those have been transformative. People use them uh, a ton. I think, uh, you know, CUDA, which is sort of, uh, I guess, spiritually a successor to Ian Buck's uh, uh, thesis work, is, is an incredibly successful um, uh, uh, NVIDIA-only uh, way to program uh, GPUs and mix CPU and GPU code. At the same time, or soon after, OpenCL came out. I've only used this once. I'm not even sure if it's still around, but it was, it didn't, it didn't pan out. And there are two uh, examples of, of sort of programmability or pushing the, the bounds of programmability that maybe are, are, are failures. And I'm not going to go into detail why, but I think it's hard. It's hard to find the, the right abstraction. And, and shaders, for example, and GPUs uh, in the early 2000s uh, did this, this really well. Um, but Cell and Laravel, so PS3. And this is also an example where you can paint yourself in the corner. If you want to make really fast cell code, it's really hard to get that running on other platforms or even PS4 or whatever consoles came out after it. And Laravel is Intel's GPU that, that uh, is, is well known. So I think there are uh, two papers and two talks uh, from this decade that I consider the most underrated. Um, uh, the first is uh, Martin Mitring's uh, presentation and advances uh, course at SIGGRAPH on CryEngine 2. This is where SSAO, um, the Crytek SSAO, and there's earlier papers on doing AO, obviously Landis's paper and volumetric obscurance from the running workshop in the late 90s. But this sort of screen space variant is, is effectively what most games um, uh, uh, move to. And it had a lot of other screen space algorithms in that, in that talk as well. Um, the second is a paper at Graphics Hardware in uh, 2007 this re reverse reprojection caching, which is essentially using temporal information from the previous frame. Um, and again, Bruce Walter and others had done ideas like this, but not on GPUs um, uh, uh, earlier. And this is a paper that I distinctly remember at the time thinking, this is a crazy idea, this would never work. Why would anyone want to do this? Um, and, and I was wrong. And I think uh, the next one I want to describe is, is a, a talk at GDC in 2009 by Nicholas Smedberg and Daniel Wright. And Daniel talked about how Gears of War 2 used SSAO and reprojection to essentially integrate uh, directions over the hemisphere 
um, more efficiently over time uh, by using this temporal reprojection. I remember suddenly emailing Diego after I saw that talk. I was like, hey, someone's using your stuff. Um, and I think this type of temporal reprojection is ubiquitous in modern game engines now. Um, and the last one uh, is morphological anti-aliasing. Another paper at the time that I thought, this is crazy, this will never work. Um, and the context was sort of ray tracing and things like this. It wasn't uh, on GPUs that came after. Um, but the idea of rendering an aliased image and then inferring the, the uh, anti-aliasing values by analyzing um, uh, something on the, on the frame buffer. Um, so this paper, I think, was hugely impactful. There was a, a session in uh, HPG in 2018 going over the impact of this paper. And I think it changed hardware roadmaps. So everything was moving towards higher multi-sampling counts and things like this. And when this paper came out, uh, I think it sort of made everyone step back and rethink. And this is commonly used with some form of temporal reprojection now as well. So, so I think those are like, in my mind, those sort of four uh, things that came out in that time frame that, that are, are, are underappreciated. So in 2010, um, I had a paper and a, a capstone talk at I3D. And that's long ago enough that I kind of remember what I was thinking at the time, where I don't think I could say that about these early 90s. Um, and one of the things, so we had an SSAO paper uh, with Brad Luce. Um, and I remember when working on this paper, I kind of thought this had a short shelf life. All these screen space algorithms have all kinds of problems. You don't have things. The depth model is just the first surface. You don't have anything behind the camera or on the sides. Uh, there are all these limitations. Uh, and I figured people will find a better place to cache or these artifacts would just be too strong and these ideas would sort of fade into the, into the mists of time. Uh, and I was completely wrong. Screen space algorithms really grew and exploded and are still used uh, today very frequently. Um, uh, I think, and, and often with these temporal reprojection uh, ideas, there's a paper in the first rendering session that sort of solves, addresses some issues with the, the depth model in, in, the, in the frame um, uh, in the next session. So I also gave a keynote talk or the capstone talk at the end of the conference. This was in spring of, of 2010 on the evolution of pre-computed lighting for games. And I distinctly remember at the time thinking real-time GI is right around the corner. So Anton Kaplanian had given a talk the previous year at SIGGRAPH and advanced his course on light propagation volumes. He had a paper at I3D this year, uh, that year on, on extending this with cascades. Um, Enlighten would be, with the use of Enlighten in, in some dice games was presented to SIGGRAPH uh, that summer. The sparse voxel Oxford GI was presented the following year um, uh, by Mitring uh, uh, on, in Unreal Engine, and Cyril Krasen had a paper on this so based on his research. And so it seemed like this stuff was going to come, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm talking about something that has a, has a short shelf life again. Um, and in sort of revisiting this, this uh, presentation, um, I have my sort of summary slides, and I think a lot of them are, are still true. Uh, one was there's this memory compute trade-off. So you can think of pre-computation as essentially time travel again, where we're trading memory uh, um, and for uh, compute and so that we can essentially enable global light effects, global lighting effects earlier than we would if we just relied on, on raw horsepower to do this. Um, there are tons of negatives and these negatives still exist today, long bake times, the constraints, um, uh, the memory trade-offs seem like they were poor. Um, uh, and I did mention this sort of continuum between completely static pre-computed and something uh, completely dynamic being interesting. And this is something I've done a little bit of work on and, and others have as well. So I think that part, you know, something panned out uh, in the middle there. And then I close my talk with this slide on, is this the end of pre-computed lighting? And the arguments why maybe it wasn't were probably similar to what we do now. So low end platforms, we iPhone, iPad. Um, uh, and then I, I think this using real-time GI for interaction is still super interesting. And, and, and I think this is a, is a big issue. And I'll touch on this in the a, in a next, uh, next slide. Um, so what else have I gotten wrong uh, recently? So in the Beyond Programmable Shading course, I had two slides that were way off base. Uh, one of them was uh, titled, Are Discrete Graphics Dead? So at the time, in 2011, all the consoles were using SOCs. Uh, tablets were really big. PC seemed like the laptops were sort of dominating and desktops were a shrinking share. Um, uh, and so I made an argument that maybe the discrete graphics were gonna die off and, and uh, they would just be replaced by these SOCs and what was the implication on APIs. And that is obviously completely wrong. Um, uh, discrete graphics are doing incredibly well still and I don't see this happening anytime soon in PC in particular. I still think it's interesting if APIs should evolve for SOCs, but um, uh, you know clearly that was a, a, a bad, uh, a prediction, if you will. And the other was stacked eye memories, which I started hearing about, I think, in the late 2000s. Um, uh, the idea being you have on the same uh, 
uh, silicon or some other way, uh, 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 a way of having memory chips that are all tightly coupled to the, the, your, your CPU. Um, and so you could have these incredibly wide buses because you don't have to go off chip and the packaging costs were cheaper. Um, this is kind of a real, real incarnation thing. If you look at the design of say the reality engine, it essentially was this, you know, they weren't on silicon, but it was boards that had all of these local memories and, and, and the compute near the memories and things like this. Um, if this did happen, uh, the limitations change. So all of a sudden memory bandwidth is, is memory has lower latency potentially and much higher bandwidth. The algorithms that are viable for games or any other interactive applications is changing. So I think this would be interesting, but this was 2011. There was some parts from uh, ATI that used this, this and NVIDIA did on some of the machine learning machines, but it really hasn't changed the world. So that's something that, that I clearly was, was wrong on. Um, and I also mentioned in, in 2015, I was in a, a Frontiers in Real-Time Rendering. I think this is the precursor to the Open Problems course at SIGGRAPH. And one of the main points that I made and Alex Evans and other people on the panel made was this sort of iteration time is everything. I still think this is true. Alex with dreams and other things has moved in a direction and addressed this more head on. Um, I think this is true uh, in our work. We've done a tiny bit around this, but we've generally been pushed to do features instead. So we haven't paid as much attention as I think we probably should have to this uh, in the last uh, five years since this, this um, uh, uh, panel. And then the other one is I talked about how can academia and industry work better together and releasing content is a great way to do this. This is something that wearing my Activision hat, uh, we really haven't done a good a job. We, we, you know, we've talked about it, but it hasn't really been something that's come to fruition. I think other companies have done a better job of, at, at getting their content uh, in the hands of, of researchers. So if I go back to this idea of the Pareto front, um, uh, what's different now from these games in the 90s? Well, there are huge differences. So scene complexity is off the charts. In the 90s, you can only do a couple of clocks per pixel. Now you can do thousands. So the performance we have, even though resolutions have grown, the performance we have at our fingertips is way higher, um, but the scenes are more complex in every possible way. Material lighting, uh, things like animation and wind, we can have uh, all vertices subtly animated every frame. Um, the streaming that's coming out with PS5 and whatever the name of the, the latest Xbox is, uh, is super exciting and, and the way we do LODs. Um, uh, so I think there's tons of changes. Um, and one interesting thing is if you look at how film moved to path tracing, they had to shed backward compatibility to do this. So you can't just support arbitrary render man, load a file in the middle of a shader and parse some text and do something. Uh, they had to restrict things for the algorithms for sampling and other kinds of things to work for PBR. And so there may be some, some uh, you know, if you want to move to the right in this graph, you might have to make some, some sacrifices as well. Um, the other thing that's changed is the overheads and bottlenecks are, are very different. So, and even the performance targets. So uh, we were 30 Hertz for a lot of games in the 2000s and, and, and then it moved to 60 Hertz. And I would say 60 Hertz is more common now. COD was one of the early games to focus on 60 Hertz performance. Um, uh, in the old COD games, they would actually take the scene geometry and they would cut it to the cone of the light so that you have this triangle has this material and this light. Um, uh, this actually obviously doesn't scale as you have more complicated materials and more complicated lights. You would have too many triangles if you subdivided everything like this and it would be an inefficient way to sort of render. And the cost of a branch in the shader was hundreds of clocks at one point and now it's not a big deal at all. Um, I'd say from this decade, uh, the most influential idea uh, in terms of game engines was this GPU-driven rendering pipeline uh, talk at the Advances course in 2015, where moving a lot of uh, scene processing to compute is something that's lifted a lot of the concerns around overheads uh, with these driver models and, and, and APIs and things. Um, so as we move forward, uh, I think it's interesting. You know, there are a bunch of choices that could be made. They're all valid. Uh, you could just say, well, we're going to back off on performance and focus on visual fidelity and get much higher quality, but you know, try and run at 30 hertz. Uh, you could you could say we're going to not even improve fidelity at all, and we're just going to focus on 120 or 240 hertz or whatever for competitive gaming. Um, I have this dot that's uh, slower, so maybe we're going to lift constraints. So Minecraft or something like this can be thought of as there's a backward step in visual quality, but you lift a lot of constraints around um, how much work it is to 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 build levels and to make interactive content. So I think these are all uh, viable steps to take and the cost of any of them is so high, you're not gonna take all of them. You know, Different parts of the industry might, but no one company can really afford to do that. Um, and a lot of this is also just the complex and complexities between all of these systems. So if you wanna move, you kind of have to move everything around. It's not just a texture mapping kernel that gets faster or something. 
So in, in closing, um, I think it's interesting to what would the future say about 2021? Are we really on the cusp of real-time GI? There's awesome stuff going on right now. So Daniel Wright, the person I mentioned, and others at Epic have some really cool real-time GI. They've shown some teasers for in uh, Unreal 5. Uh, there's all the work NVIDIA has done and Morgan McGuire and others on these, on these real-time GI algorithms. And so it feels kind of like it did in 2010, where it's like, it's all almost here. Um, uh, uh, and, and it'll be interesting to see if it, it's for real this time. Um, uh, is rasterization dead? So hardware ray tracing is, is really exciting. Um, is it another geometry shader? Not from the standpoint of it's not solving a useful problem, but from a standpoint of our variances in performance or other, other uh, things going to be so big that it's hard to use. Um, if ray tracing is the future, do we have to add constraints for it to be performance? So Mesh shaders, for example, which are sort of the spiritual successor of that Altonen talk I referred to, um, uh, they want to deform things in a way that's not super BBH friendly. And so all the subtle animation and deformation, maybe you need to back off on that if you really want to push on ray tracing, just, just for because it doesn't handle uh, those kinds of changes as well as, as, uh, as sort of conventional engines. Um, and so APIs have gotten much closer. So if you look at DX12 or Vulkan, they're much closer to the hardware but it's also a lot more work. One nice thing about OpenGL was Hello World was only you know, a little bit of code to get something up and running. Um, I'm not that concerned about this. I use Shader Toy, you can use WebGL. They're pretty good APIs for quick prototyping, um, but, but uh, it'll be interesting to see where APIs go and if things like SOCs really change the direction of these um, or not. Uh, uh, finally, you know, is I3D 2031 gonna be in person? Um, I sure hope it is. Um, uh, so that's my, my uh, presentation. Uh, there are some people that gave me um, images and feedback on earlier drafts of my talk. All right, thanks, Peter Park. That was very entertaining and informative throwback to some of the early stages of interactive rendering. So there has to, uh, so we have a few questions from the audience and uh, I'm just gonna start asking these. There's an interesting question from Ziozen uh, regarding your thoughts about advant advantages and disadvantages to learning graphics programming now versus back in the day, 20, 30 years ago when you started. And if you could have altered time, would you rather have been born or started earlier or later in this regard? Um, uh, so I guess, uh, I think one huge difference was the internet sucked back then. So. So like now you can just search for something and you'll find it somewhere. So the access to information was a lot harder, even go into the library. I remember when I went to MSR, one of the awesomest things they had was there was an email alias. I could find any obscure paper. Oh, Robert's 1949 book on Sorka harmonics. I emailed alias and in two days it's on my desk, uh, which I did not have in university, even though university libraries were good. So I think the access to information is so amazing now that it's, it's definitely something. It was fun. I think seeing the transition where like, oh, you could do this crazy stuff and then you kind of evolved um, uh, where it was only people with these million dollar computers uh, and then it changed to anyone could, could do things, uh, I think has, has been, been, been really cool. Um, uh, what was there another part of that question that didn't answer? Well, I guess it could be boiled down to what's the best API to learn today? And do you think Tyrex 12, for instance, is, is the best place to start graphics programming if, if you would start today? Actually, I would probably start on Shader Toy. Uh, you know, I think Shader Toy, the, the interactive loop is amazing. I think you can be really creative. I think it's, it's you know, so DX12, getting DX12 up, I guess if you're a masochist, maybe it's fun, but it's, it, and it has, you know, it's not a terrible experience. If you wanna work on a game engine somewhere, maybe it's not a bad thing to have done, but for learning actual graphics algorithms, I'm not sure it's the, it's the, it's the best uh, starting point. All right, thanks. And then we have uh, Navalil Mukherjee ask, uh, how did the SGI reality engine handle transparency? Do you have any recollection? So the reality engine, um, no nothing handled transparency that well. Uh, you could sort and do blending. It had uh, a form of screen door transparency. So the reality engine had like up to, I think it was up to 1,024 bits per pixel. So the memory in the frame buffer was distributed across all these raster manager boards. Um, and you could use essentially ordered dithering patterns to do transparency. So sort of stochastic style transparency. Um, and these, done, these were done at this sample level. So, so you could have, I forget how many, uh, however you chop up that 1,024 bits, is, is, which is the max you could have. 
uh, would be would be the sample count. So it had it had uh, that's that's sort of the way you do it. But that that screen door cell transparency wasn't great. I think transparency is still hard. Is the short answer? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so another question here from Akash: uh, Do you think analytic formulae for shading and show shadows from area lights, and this is related to the linearly transformed cosines from highs and, and others? Uh, do you think this has scope in the sense that the shade rays could be used for other things like GI? I guess the thing, yeah, in, in general, how would you combine these LTCs with, with ray tracing and, and GI? Well, I, so I think Eric talks about this. Uh, so Eric's shadow paper where you decouple sort of the estimate of this integral and, you, and, and visibility um, allows you to uh, essentially have better convergence. Uh, you have perfect convergence in unshadowed or fully shadowed areas, right? Is one way to look at this. Um, so I think these algorithms are useful. I think way in the trade-off is tricky. So some of these analytics, so for example, uh, there were analytic um, uh, solutions to some scattering equations uh, by uh, Vincent something from Utah. And these are things that there are times when the analytic solutions are less efficient than numerical algorithms or have more numerical corner cases. So, um, uh, but I think I think the linear transform, transform cosines are a good example. They're a little heavy still, but they're, they're definitely, uh, I don't think there's any equivalent cost numerical algorithm to generate uh, this sort of uh, analytic, this, these lighting integrals that, uh, compared to that. Um, and then how does that relate to, to, to shadow rays? Um, uh, I guess for shadow rays, I think like, I mean, I guess how do you allocate your ray budget in general isn't, is a complicated problem that people working on ray tracing are still scratching their heads over. So I don't, I don't, uh, I, I, I guess, yes, you have, you need fewer, Rays potentially to compute some lighting uh, integrals, but like maybe you want to use the stuff that um, uh, uh, Dartmouth and Nvidia have done for direct light sampling. I'm not sure where the trade-off goes uh, in in general. Right. And we have a really broad question here from uh, Tovaki Takikawa. Um, based on your last 20 years of experience, what capabilities do you think rendering graphics will have in the next 20 years? So another prediction task for you. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, so I think, I mean, one thing I do think is, I think uh, for interactive graphics, um, I think content facing, uh, so how do we author these crazy worlds? How do, we, how do we enable the artist to be more creative and unleashed? I think this is almost a more interesting problem than some new motion blur algorithm or things like this. Um, uh, so, so I guess that, that's, that's one point is I think this, this, what is it? What is the artist facing consequences of the crazy performance that we have today, uh, versus you know, oh, you're going to be able to do you know whatever relativistic lighting or you know this you know these. I think I think I don't think we're at diminishing returns and that you know there's still a ton of you know if we had ten times the compute we would use it instantly. Um, so I don't think we're we're uh, it's not like you know you give us extra resources we can't make a better image. Um, but but I think these. These sort of content and you know user creation of content or artist creation of content facing problems and what does it mean? What does all the horsepower we have mean for that? Is is really exciting. That's exciting, and that kind of brings brings me to think about machine learning and uh, what are your thoughts on how would you combine machine learning and rendering? We have seen all these uh, neural radiance fields and so forth, and how do you see this vector evolving uh, with regards to game technology? Well, so and I, I think so. A lot of these ones are are pretty expensive still. So they're interesting. Um, I think for like uh, like I guess like DLSS is probably the most ex successful one that's actually shipped and and, and used in practice. Um, uh, I think I think machine learning for content creation is really interesting. Now there's a problem with you don't have as much data, so you have to use these few shot algorithms. And there's you know machine learning technology that's evolving uh, towards that. Um, but there, the performance restrictions aren't there. For 60 hertz or 120 hertz video games, I think the performance is something that is a, a, a concern. And you can do, Marco Salvi has talked about this, other people have, where you can use machine learning to figure out parameters of other models and things like this. But I think brute force, oh, let's just uh, you know do neural radiance transfer or neural rendering. Um, I think that's still a ways out from being, being uh, practical. Um, yeah, this 
this brings me to the beginning of your talk when, when during the 90s we started with software rendering and then then during the 2000s we kind of went to this uh, fixed function rendering we had these first gpus uh, come out and then then we kind of uh, exposed the program programmability capabilities and now it seems we are kind of moving back to software rendering in the sense that we have games coming out with lots of specialized renderers for hair particles. We have hybrid combination that shoots some rays for shadows and all this increases complexity. So I was wondering like, how far do you think it's viable to go down this route to specialize and add complexity to the game engines? Yeah, I, I think, I think it, well, it is. So the amount of work to innovate is an exponential, right? This is like, we have more is lost, we can do more. But now if we need to bring everything along, I think this is a, is a challenge. Another way to look at it is how many samples can we draw in engine architecture, right? It's not like you can do thousands of them. The amount of mountain years to create an engine is way more now than it was in the 90s. Um, uh, so we don't, have, we don't have lots of opportunity to try thousands of different variants. We kind of have to make some educated guess and, and, and jump. Um, uh, I think Sutherland has this paper on the wheel of reincarnation, which is sort of looking at how algorithms move between hardware and software over time, uh, which I think is totally relevant to what we see today. And again, this generality, so we have had missteps. So uh, compute traders have been successful and there's exciting things The you know, whatever I've seen of the Nanite stuff that Epic is doing, for example, is super exciting that has this customized GPU uh, path clearly. Um, um, but I think, you know, that has, that's fraught with peril as well. And that if one vendor has, you know, something that has a cliff that's totally different than another vendor, uh, this can be can be can be tricky, but 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 yeah, I don't know. I think we are we are exploring the, the complexity envelope pretty aggressively in the industry. Is, I guess a, a pity answer to that. But. Yeah, and that's uh, I think that's why it's an interesting and exciting field to work in as well. Um, I guess we'll have one last question, and that's related to ray tracing. What are your thoughts on on real time ray tracing now, and especially with regards to the new hardware that has come out in the recent console? Yeah, so I have technology to build games on, I guess. I, I mean, I guess my, so we, we have multiple vendors that have it. I think for like a lot of games, I think when hardware becomes min spec is when it's sort of most exciting. So for example, ray tracing in a game today, uh, in general, you can't rely on it because a lot of your users won't have it, right? So it's only on the newest consoles and, and uh, some, some of the highest end hardware. So I think this will be a lot more exciting when the hardware of today is min spec, which is five years out or whatever. Um, uh, I think the concern would be if the variability in performance uh, between vendors is is really large, this will be problematic and be it could be difficult. I do think there are, uh, and Colin's going to talk about this, and he has way more experience with this than I do. Um, I think there are things that ray tracing does uh, better and worse. And if you really want to push on it, you're going to have to make choices to restrict things uh, to what it's it's efficient at. And that can evolve. So for example, deformation, you could have BVHs in hardware that are, are smart and just like motion blur BVHs that Ember uses and other, other things. So uh, maybe you need some low, low, low dimensional uh, deformation model that you can have a BVH quickly evaluate to as you trace rays or things like this. So I think for, for, for certain things, uh, it's bad now, but maybe it could get, it could get better either by not doing that or by or by evolving the hardware in a way. But then again, it's when that hardware is min spec that it's exciting again. So, so I think it's I think it's I think the jury's it's too early to to tell still. All right, I think we are uh, running out of time. So thank you again, Peter Park, for uh, for the keynote and, and this Q and A session. And uh, yeah. The next session is going to start in 15 minutes, so I guess there's going to be a quick break before that. And uh, yeah, I'll see you, see everybody on the next rendering session. Thank you.
Okay, hello and welcome to the first paper session of I3D 2021, everyone. Um, so today's first session, well, both of today's sessions are about rendering. Uh, and for this first one, I have the privilege of chairing. So my name is Eric Sintorn. I am an associate professor at Chalmers University in Gothenburg. That's in Sweden. Okay, we've got three very interesting papers in this session. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the authors. Um, after that, we're going to play all of the uh, pre-recorded presentations back to back. And after that, we have a Q&A session. So uh, the first paper we'll see is real-time geometric glint anti-aliasing with normal map filtering. Uh, this paper is written by Xavier Germain, Simon Lucas, Basile Savage, Jean-Michel Dischler, and Kasten Dachsbacher. Uh, the first four of these are from the University of Strasbourg in France, and Kasten is at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. The next paper will be real-time subsurface control variates, temporally stable adaptive sampling and it's written by Chen Chen Chi and Mark Olano, and they are both from the University of Maryland. And Chen Chen Chi will give the presentation. Finally, we will learn about stochastic depth ambient occlusion. And this paper is written by Job Vermeer, Leonardo Scandolo, and Elma Eisemann. And all of these guys are from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And, uh, Job will be in the presentation, talk in the presentation, but Leonardo is here to answer questions. So, as I said, we'll now run all of the presentations back to back, and after that, we will have a QA uh, session. So, please write whatever questions pop up into Discord or into the YouTube channel, uh, and we'll discuss them when we're done. And take this chance to get your questions answered by the authors. So, thank you. And let's see the presentations. Hi, I'm Xavier. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Strasbourg, and I'm going to present with Simon Luca our work entitled Real-Time Geometric Glint Anti-Aliasing with Normal Map Filtering. This project was also realized with Basile Sauvage and Jean-Michel Dischler from the University of Strasbourg and with Karsten Dasbacher from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Our work is about glints. Many surfaces in the real world are glittery, like snow here. Sand, some stones, and some coatings are also glittery. Glittering surfaces have BRDFs with specific properties. The BRDF of a glittering surface is high frequency. It has several lobes. These glittering BRDFs are also scale dependent. The shape of the BRDF changes according to the area of the surface considered. When zoom out, the lobes are averaged to form a single large specular lobe. Finally, glittering materials have a BRDF that varies spatially. That is, the shape of the BRDF changes across the surface. All these properties make glittering BRDF difficult to model, especially in real time. Several methods exist to render glittering surfaces in real time. The glittering BRDF of Zer and Kaplan is very efficient and does not consume memory. But this method is not physically based. The BRDF is not normalized and it does not handle invariant map maps. The glittering BRDF of Wong and colleagues is expensive in computation time and memory, with more than 256 megabytes. But this model is physically based and lighting by invariant map is possible. Finally, the glittering BRDF of Sherman and colleagues as performance in between these two methods uses very little memory 
and is physically based. But as with the and Kaplan method, invariant maps are not supported. I refrain from giving my opinion on which of these glittering BRDF is the best. On the other hand, I can tell you uh, that these uh, three glittering BRDFs are prone to geometric glint aliasing. This is an excerpt from the video by Wang and colleagues. In the curved areas, at the position of my mouse, you can see geometry glint aliasing, which is expressed as chaotic specular shimmer. Note that this aliasing is not visible in relatively flat areas. Here is another example of glint aliasing with the BRDF of Shama and colleagues. You can note that the chaotic specular shimmer is not visible in the reference obtained by oversampling the pixel. One of the objectives of our article is to solve this aliasing problem. Geometric glint aliasing is very similar to geometric specular aliasing, which has already been addressed by Kaplan and colleagues in 2016 and Tokuyoshi and Kaplan in 2019. Both methods propose a specular anti-aliasing technique suitable for real-time rendering where few samples per pixel are used. I will now explain how the method works before explaining how we have adapted to glittering materials. When rendering a curved surface with a small specular lobe in real time, there is a good chance that the specular lobe is missed. Indeed, the specular lobe can fall between two pixels, as here. To explain specular aliasing, you should know that a specular BRDF is evaluated with the vector halfway between the camera direction and the light. Specifically, the slopes associated with these vectors are used for evaluation. If these half vectors and slopes are represented in the tangent space of the surface, you can see that they vary a lot from one pixel to another. These strong variations make the very sharp lobe of the slope distribution function abbreviated FDF, lie between two slope samples. The anti-aliasing method proposed by Kaplan and colleagues is based on the finite differences of the half slopes between two neighboring pixels. These finite differences are quickly and easily computed on GPU and are used to filter the FDF. The finite, the finite differences give the size of the filter kernel. This anti-aliasing method is very efficient and is now used in several real-time rendering engines like Filament or Unity. This anti-aliasing is effective because if the filter kernel is Gaussian and if the slope distribution is also Gaussian, then the convolution of the two functions has an analytical form, which is perfect for real-time. When the surface is sparkling, the slope distribution is multi -lobe. and this time, there is no simple solution to the convolution, no matter what the shape of the kernel. We still manage to evaluate this convolution in real time, and this is the first contribution of our work. Now, I'm going to present this contribution, which I call GGAA for Geometric Glint Anti-Aliasing. We base our work on the glittering SDF of Shaman and colleagues, which is well suited because their SDF is defined as a weighted sum of tensor products of two 1D distributions. These 1D distributions are stored in 1D textures. The main idea of our GGAA method is to map map these 1D textures to evaluate a filtered version of the 1D distributions on the fly and in real time. We have done the filtering of the glittering SDFs of Zura and Kaplan and Wang and colleagues because their glittering SDF is the result of a stochastic process of counting microfacets. To filter the glittering SDF, one would have to filter the specular microfacet counting process, and this is not trivial. I will now explain how the glittering BRDF of Sherman and colleagues is evaluated before explaining how we filter it on the fly. 
The glittering surface is seen through a pixel. The size of the pixel footprint allows access to two adjacent levels of details of a virtual MIP hierarchy, where the surface is partitioned into cells. The coordinate of a cell allows to randomly select two 1D distributions contained in a set of 1D textures. The tensor product of these two distributions gives the 2D SDF of the cell. The transformation M is applied to this distribution, which allows to design the lobe, but also to control the roughness of the material. This operation is applied to each cell, which gives the PSDF of this LOD. The same process is applied to the lower LOD. Interpolation between the two PSDFs at adjacent LODs gives the slope distribution in the pixel footprint P. Our method of geometric linked anti-aliasing consists of filtering this PSDF when the surface is curved using a kernel K. Since the PSDF is a weighting sum of tra transform 2D distributions, then filtering the PSDF amounts to filtering independently each transform distribution of each cell. Filtering the transform SDF is the same as filtering the original 2D SDF where inverse M is applied to K. Finally, filtering the 2D SDF with transform K amounts to filtering each 1D distribution of the tensor product independently. To be able to evaluate filtered versions of the 1D distributions in real time, we map map them. In the method of Sherman and colleagues, the 1D distributions were stored in an OpenGL 1D array texture. So, we pre-filter these textures before rendering with gel generate mipmap. Then, during the rendering, we evaluate the size of the kernel with the OpenGL functions dfdx and dfdfy. Finally, we evaluate the glittering SDF. Before, an evaluation for discrete slope was done with a texture LOD. We replace this OpenGL call by a texture grad call to evaluate the 1D distributions with the KA and KY filter kernels. Our method of glint anti-aliasing is therefore relatively simple. We need to compute the finite pixel-to-pixel -pixel slope differences, then filter the 1D SDFs on the fly using texture grad instead of texture LOD. These small differences in the code make it possible to have a rendering where most of the glint aliasing has disappeared, as shown here in the middle. On the right, you have the reference, and on the left, the original method. Here is another result, using the Hartic landscape. Here again, most of the glint aliasing has disappeared. Geometric glint anti-aliasing reduces the differences to the reference in the foreground. But in the reference, in the background, the specular lobe is larger. Here, the surface is enhanced by a normal map. So we have to filter the normal map to increase the roughness of the material in the background in order to have a rendering more similar to the reference. This is the subject of our second contribution and I let Simon speak. Hello everyone, I'm going to present you the second contribution, which is the combination of normal map filtering with glint rendering. So real-time normal map filtering is a problem already addressed by the community for specular surfaces. Glint mapping stored the first and second order moments of the normal map to compute in real time in the pixel footprint P the standard deviation of slopes in X sigma X the standard deviation of slopes in y sigma y, and the slope correlation factor rho. These three parameters are then used by the BRTF. Concretely, the mapping increases the roughness of the material when it is necessary. Leader mapping improves the mapping by proposing a Smith masking term adapted to off-center slope distributions. Since the BRDF, the thin the glinty BRDF of Chama and colleagues is restricted to a VKVT masking term, we can't use leader mapping, therefore we use lean mapping. 
In order to combine the rendering of cleans and the filtering of normals map, we propose to use the BRGF parameters given by lean mapping in the render in the clintering BRDF of Jam and Colleague. This uh, BRDF is controlled by the slope standard deviation in X and Y, but the BRDF do not take into account the slope correlation factor O. In this method, the authors explain that the 1D distributions stored in memory were generated with a sigma O original standard deviation. These distributions are transformed by a matrix M to control the standard deviation of slopes sigma x and sigma y without having to regenerate another dictionary of 1D distributions. We propose a new matrix M to allow us to control rho in addition to the standard deviations. Controlling rho makes the glintering BRDF compatible with normal snap filtering using lean mapping. The implementation is simple. All you need is to change the matrix M in the code. In the third column, you can see the result of the combination of clintering BRDF and lean filtering. You can see that the specular lobe now has a similar shape to the reference, so the differences have been reduced. However, the method has a limitation. It assumes a, Gauss a Gaussian distribution of slopes and normal normals in a normal map. If it's not the case, the surface may be too rough or too sparkling. In this work, a method called GTAA, allowing geometry cleans and aliasing, was presented. The additional cost in memory and, compu and computation time is relatively low. Even if a major part of the cleans aliasing is removed, this aliasing is not completely removed. We have proposed a, a method to combine Green's rendering and normal map filtering by introducing a slope correlation factor in the BRDF of Gemma and colleague. This method is based on lean mapping and assumes that the SDF is Gaussian and that the normal map induces Gaussian normal distributions. If it's not the case, the surface may be too rough or too sparkling. Finally, I would like to point out that the code is accessible on GitHub at this address and thank you for your attention and if you have any question don't hesitate thank you hi my name is Tintin. today i'm going to present real-time subsurface control variance temporary stable adaptive sampling co-authored with mark of Leno. in this paper we're going to talk about real-time subsurface scattering again especially how we use control variance to make real-time adaptive sampling temporarily stable in subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering is a demanding feature in real-time graphics. For this whole scene rendered in Unreal Engine 4, if we apply screen space subsurface scattering with Bertie's diffusion profile, it looks much better but at high rendering cost. In order to get this image in soft look, we need to solve this simplified equation in screen space, where B is the screen space pre-integrated lighting, R is the diffuse reflectance profile. To solve this problem in rendering, we can use multicolor sampling for each pixel, like this with uniform 64 samples per pixel everywhere, either around side regions or over flat regions. However, a uniform sampling of 64 samples per pixel creates high bandwidth demands and thus is expensive in real-time rendering. To reduce the bandwidth demands, real-time adaptive sampling can be used. Real-time adaptive sampling is proposed in our previous work in 2020, where different regions are predicted with different sample count to reach a target quality in real time. For example, the flat region on the teapot leads only 8 samples per pixel instead of 64. There are two steps in the algorithm. Step 1, variance tracking. We can use exponential moving variance to record the variance history. In step 2, we estimate the sample count 
for the current frame based on the fundamental principle that the variance halves when the sample count doubles with two approximations. First, we approximate the last sample count by the previous average. Then, n frame average is approximated with n frame exponential moving average. The algorithm has good performance for stable scenes. However, dynamic lighting leads to unstable performance. Here, we show the scene and the, the corresponding sample count. The bottom shows the sampling pastime and the average samples per pixel for the whole frame. As you can see, turning on off the light added the temporal variance of the lighting that increases the sample count and the corresponding sampling pastime. So, how can we use the spatial variance in static scene previously in real-time adaptive sampling and reduce the temporal variance during dynamic scene at the same time? to achieve temporally stable adaptive sampling. To achieve this, we seek to use contravariance. Before running into the detailed design to use subsurface contravariance, let's first analyze the variance and then solve the problem on a simplified example in temporal domain. For a spatial variable f and another temporal variable t, the variance of the Monte Carlo sampling of their product can be decomposed into two terms, where T and F are independent. As we know, when the total sample count increases at each sampling time, the variance of F decreases. It reduces the total variance of the green term. However, no matter how many samples are used, the second term is not affected. So, how to get rid of the second term for variance tracking? And what is the first term? If you have read the paper, it is the variance of contravariance residual. We can track that directly. Let's review the standard contravariance usage. If we want to integrate a function over the domain shown here numerically for each pixel, like 16 samples per pixel, we have an estimation which has a large error when compared to the ground truth. To improve the estimation, we can add a control variable directly with a known integration to reduce the error. However, it can lead to higher error if not well selected. Even with this counter variable, we can still find an optimal scale factor numerically beforehand. In the same sampling configuration, it leads to less error when compared to the ground truth. This scaling factor is the control variance coefficient, and the integration part is a control variance residual. In computer graphics, when contravariance coefficient is a predefined constant like 1, it is usually called the main part separation. Otherwise, different methods have been used to get optimal contravariance coefficient like penalized least squares, iterative estimators, and deep learning. However, if we have a temporal component, This temporal dynamic still impacts the error a lot with inference standard contravariance. If we take time into the formula and we know future samples, we can arrive at a contravariance coefficient that leads to a residual close to zero. The periodic notch error can be removed. However, in real time rendering, we do not know the future. Moreover, we have another issue from sampling G, because sampling G could double the bandwidth, and it could add in new sampling errors. So, how to solve the contravariance coefficient formula online? 
Actually, if T is independent from F and G, we can have a simplified formula if G is a constant counter variable. When we do not have this independence assumption, we proposed exponential moving covariance matrix, which uses more recent observations to update the covariance. Then, the contravariance coefficient can be estimated online with this formula. Here, we illustrate the contravariance residual error between the optimal contravariance coefficient and our online estimation. Our online estimation reduces the periodic error similar to optimal contravariance coefficient. Now that we know how to reduce the temporal variance with contravariance, let's apply the online contravariance coefficient estimation to real-time subsurface scattering. Let's go back to the example demonstrated in the motivation example. Let's see how the contravariance coefficient changes according to time. Note that in the visualization, most regions are actually blue. That is because for large flight lighting region, we have a theoretic optimal contravariance coefficient, which is one for subsurface scattering. Now that we have the subsurface contravariance, let's integrate it into real-time adaptive sampling to estimate sample count. Note that our application of contravariance is different from the typical use where contravariance are applied in shading domain. Instead, we apply it in the sample domain. To reduce overestimated sample count, our application will not create bias in rendering. What we see here is the real-time adaptive sampling algorithm. Each time when we get the pre-integrated lighting, a sample count map MT is estimated for each pixel based on history in the previous frame. After sampling, three history channels are updated for sample count estimation, the mean sample count, the variance, and the mean of luminance. For our paper, real-time subsurface counter variance, we added another history texture to store the compact history for counter variance coefficient estimation. The four channels are covariance, counter variable variance, mean luminance and mean counter variable. The counter variance residual replaces the luminance in real-time adaptive sampling algorithm. And this is our online counter variance method for subsurface scattering. In fact, we can have an estimation of applying constant counter variance with a coefficient of 1. Then, no more textures are added. Let's go back to the motivation example again. Here we show the sample count differences between online and constant counter variance. We could observe less samples in constant counter variance. For subsurface scattering, we also find that it is important to separate the direct and distant scattering. In order to shade the subsurface scattering for a point B, we apply a filter curl onto the pre-integrated lighting texture, where we can divide the applied region into two parts, the direct scattering region and distant scattering. Since the pre-integrated lighting texture in reality is actually discrete, the direct lighting region can be approximated by a pixel value as constant diffuse. More specifically, in the important sampling framework, the scattering result is a discrete lighting at that pixel by the CDF, which is a constant. Then, we only need to check the variance of distant scattering and apply contravariance there, and estimate sample counts for distant scattering. The change of variance tracking has two implementations. First, if the distant scattering energy is very small, we could actually ignore it and achieve zero distant scattering samples in the same model. Second, 
TAA creates jitter samplings, which could bring variance even for diffuse, separating the scattering and only monitoring the variance for distant scattering helps to remove sample counts due to jittering, like at the solute edge during stabilizing. Now let's see some results. In this regular lighting scene, we simulate occasional light change. The sample count visualization of the SPVG 2020 paper and this paper is also presented. The bottom shows the corresponding sampling pastime and the average samples per pixel. In this light flash sim, we simulate gunshots and lantling with Lieutenant Benica, a paragon character. In this dynamic sim, we simulate dynamic moving shadow effects on subsurface scattering objects. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Job van Meer, and together with Leonardo Scandolo and Elmer Eisenman, I represent to you Stochastic Death Ambient Occlusion. But before we dive into our method, let's first discuss what ambient occlusion is in general. So, ambient occlusion, or AO for short, measures how geometrically occluded each point is in the scene, and it can be used to modulate the ambient light that reaches those points accordingly. It typically darkens corners and creases, and as you can see here when we enable the ambient occlusion, the image looks more natural. If we take a look at only the ambient occlusion, we see that indeed darkens corners and creases where light is less likely to reach. White here means no occlusion, while black means highly occluded. So how do we compute this ambient occlusion? Well, suppose that we have a point P and a normal N and some geometry around it. Then we can look into the normal oriented hemisphere with the radius R to determine how much the geometry occludes point P. We do this by integrating over all the directions in this hemisphere. And for each direction, we determine whether it's occluded by geometry or not. And we get something like this, where red means occluded and green means unoccluded then the ambient occlusion is simply the fraction of unoccluded directions. But this approach is not really suitable for real-time applications, since it requires us to trace many rays. Instead, ambient occlusion is often approximated in screen space by working directly on the depth buffer. In this presentation, we will mostly focus on horizon-based ambient occlusion. So a depth buffer stores in each texel a certain depth value, and we can look at this depth buffer as sort of a height field that represents the scene's geometry and something that we can march over. We will represent this depth buffer as a grid of texels with a point P and again with a radius R. So we have a similar situation as before, but now I also draw the tangent vector T. Here, horizon-based ambient occlusion aims to find a cone that indicates the unoccluded directions. It does this by marching over the geometry in multiple directions on the XY plane. So in each direction, we march over the geometry like this. And then, for each sample point, we determine the vector from P into the direction of the sample point, and we compute the angle of this vector with the tangent vector T. We do this for all the sample points, and we keep the vector with the largest angle, this one. If we then do this for all the directions, we get a cone that indicates the unoccluded region, similar to what we found with ray tracing. After this, we apply a bilateral filter to smooth out and remove any noise. And then, this is the final result. Now, if we move the camera around, however, something is off. As you could see, the ambient occlusion around the object behind the pillar suddenly pops in and out when we move the camera around. But why does this happen? Well, suppose we have a similar situation as before, with this factor being the factor with the largest angle. 
But now we put a wall, or in this case a pillar in front of it, then the situation changes slightly. This wall now occludes the geometry behind it, and with only the information as depth buffer, we will not really know what kind of geometry was behind this pillar. Also, these samples on the wall, they are outside of the radius R, so they get ignored in the emit occlusion computation. This means that the factor with the largest angle that we now find is this one, resulting in missing occlusion to what we expect to find. But what can we really do about this? We can't really see through objects, right? Well, can we? If we render the scene as transparent, then we will know what is behind this pillar. So this idea is rather cool, but most transparency algorithms are quite slow, and we want to keep the real-time performance. So we could sort and draw all fragments in a back-to-front order, but sorting thousands of fragments in real-time is not really feasible. So we scratch that. We could also render each depth layer in a separate pass, but still, the render cost is highly scene-dependent and not really feasible in real-time, except for very few layers. So we also scratch that. Then we could, for each pixel, store all the transparent fragments, while we're Getting close, but still this has unbounded and highly scene-dependent memory requirements. But what if we instead approximate this by only storing a bounded number of fragments? Well, this is where stochastic transparency comes in. It's based on screen door transparency, which is sort of like a fake transparency technique where we discard pixels in a stipple pattern to create the illusion of transparency, but instead we use MSAA to store and blend fragment information from multiple depth layers. Stochastic transparency is an approximation that's only correct on average, but it stores a fixed number of fragments and requires a fixed number of render passes, making it work well for real-time applications. So, how does it work? When rendering a fragment, we will for each MSA sample throw an alpha-weighted coin. Based on the outcome of this coin flip, we just store or discard the fragment, retaining only the frontmost fragments for each MSA sample. So let's look at an example with two health transparent triangles, both with an alpha of 0.5. Then we'll zoom in on this pixel and use 4 times MSA, meaning that we take 4 samples per pixel. Then the green fragment with an alpha of 0.5 will on average be stored in half of these samples, for example these two. Then we render the red fragment, which will again be stored in roughly half of these samples, for example these two. Since the one in front, it will overwrite the green samples, and if we then blend the colors of all these samples together, we get the final color. An image rendered with stochastic transparency looks like this. It's fairly noisy, but still a decent approximation, and most importantly, it allows us to see through objects in real time. But for the image occlusion, we are not really interested in the colors, but more in the depth values of these samples. In our method, we will render the whole scene as being transparent with the global alpha value, and we will call the resulting multi-sample depth buffer the stochastic depth buffer. Because we're still in essence rendering a depth buffer, we can also take advantage of hardware-supported depth testing to reduce overdraw and increase efficiency. So with our method, stochastic depth ambient occlusion, we extend traditional screen space ambient occlusion techniques, and instead of marching over the regular depth buffer, we now march over the stochastic depth buffer. So for each point P on the screen, for each step in each direction that we march in, we will now read all the depth values from the stochastic depth buffer. We will then compute the ambient occlusion using all these values, and then take the maximum. Note that we use a regular depth buffer instead of the stochastic depth buffer to determine the points for which you want to compute the ambient occlusion. The regular depth buffer only stores geometry visible on screen, and while we want to take the geometry into account when computing the ambient occlusion, we don't want to compute the ambient occlusion for geometry not visible on screen. So when there is occluding geometry resulting in missing occlusion with traditional screen space techniques, stochastic depth ambient occlusion allows us to sample from multiple depth layers to compute the correct ambient occlusion. Stochastic depth ambient occlusion also generalizes well to other screen space ambient occlusion techniques, for example Crytex SSAO or NVIDIA's HPAL+. The principle is the same, but the actual ambient occlusion computation is slightly different. So now onto the results. When we move the camera around with stochastic depth ambient occlusion, we see that the occlusion now stays consistent and doesn't disappear anymore. When we compare stochastic depth ambient occlusion to regular horizon based ambient occlusion and a ground through depth peeling version that has access to all the depth layers in all pixels, we can see that stochastic depth ambient occlusion is able to capture the missing occlusion quite well 
and that it comes very close to the death cleaning reference solution. When we take a look at the runtimes, we have included both the results for 1080p and 540p, because ambient occlusion is often rendered at half of resolution, we can see that stochastic depth ambient occlusion maintains real-time performance. For lower sample counts, the performance cost is relatively small. We can also see that doubling the samples roughly doubles the ambient occlusion runtime. When we compare the results of stochastic depth ambient occlusion with different sample counts, we see that with the lower sample counts, we see more noise in the areas where the ambient occlusion only depends on the stochastic samples. But from four samples and up, this difference in quality becomes very small. There are also some limitations to this technique, mainly that with many depth layers, the ambient occlusion can still be underestimated. Suppose that we add some extra depth layers behind this pillar like this. Then, when we add more and more layers, we see that the occlusion gradually disappears. This is because we increase the chance that we fail to capture the depth layer that will result in a maximum occlusion in our stochastic depth buffer. We can mitigate this somewhat by artificially increasing the ambient occlusion contribution of these stochastic samples, compensating for the fact that we may miss the depth layer that will lead to the maximum occlusion. But this may cause overestimation in other areas. Another solution will be to lower the global alpha value at which we render the stochastic depth buffer, or to possibly use temporal filtering. Another issue that we see is low frequency noise under motion, especially when we use lower sample counts, as you can see here with two samples. We also extend stochastic depth ambient occlusion to improve upon multi-fuel ambient occlusion and band normal and cone computations. So obstructed geometry is not the only issue with screen space ambient occlusion. We also lack information about geometry that is at a grazing angle with the camera, again resulting in missing occlusion. So, from a top-down view, we see that the sides of this rectangle are not visible to the camera, resulting in missing occlusion in the red areas. Multi-view ambient occlusion solves this by using additional cameras with different viewpoints from the main camera. Suppose that we want to compute the ambient occlusion at this point in the scene, then we project it onto the primary and onto the secondary camera's image plane. We then compute the ambient occlusion for both cameras separately, and we take the maximum occlusion. There's just one problem with this approach. That is that in many scenes, we can't simply place an additional camera and expect to see the same geometry as the main camera. Often there's other geometry in the way. For example, there could be a wall like this. This is also where stochastic depth ambient occlusion comes in, since it allows us to compute the ambient occlusion for obstructed geometry, removing the issue of obstructions and trivializing secondary camera placement. As you can see here, multi-view stochastic depth ambient occlusion successfully captures the otherwise missing occlusion on the sides of this rectangle. In terms of performance, multi-view stochastic depth ambient occlusion takes roughly twice as long as regular stochastic depth ambient occlusion, which makes sense, so we now render two stochastic depth buffers and we compute the ambient occlusion twice. With a half resolution stochastic depth buffer, the runtime only increases by a factor of 1.5 compared to regular stochastic depth ambient occlusion with only a small decrease in quality. Stochastic depth ambient occlusion can also be used to improve upon bent normals and cones. When using image-based lighting, for example, one often uses the fragments normal to determine the light it receives from the environment. To get more accurate lighting, however, a bent normal that points into the average unoccluded direction is used instead, in this example receiving more red light. Bent normals are often computed during the ambient occlusion computation, and by computing them during the stochastic depth ambient occlusion computation, we can improve their robustness, especially under motion, when geometry becomes occluded. Here, the bent normals generated using stochastic depth ambient occlusion along the wall's edge remain consistent, producing a red tint on the floor which is not present with traditional screen space ambient occlusion. So to conclude, we combine screen space ambient occlusion with stochastic transparency to provide information about multiple depth layers. This avoids the problem of hidden geometry in a simple and robust manner, easily extends to multiple views, and can be used to improve upon bent normals and cones. That's all. Thank you for listening. Okay. Great. Welcome back, everyone. Great work uh, to all of the authors. Uh, really interesting stuff. So now we're going to have a Q&A session. And um, whatever questions you have, you can still uh, write them into Discord or into the YouTube channel 
and I will forward them to the authors. Um, so I'm going to start, actually, while you print down your questions, I'm going to start with some of my own. Uh, and let's do it, well, we'll do it in the order that it says here. Uh, oh, by the way, I should apologize. I introduced you and Marco Lono as being from University of Maryland. It should have been University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which I ignorantly did not know was uh, not the same thing. So sorry about that. Anywho, um, looking at your paper and com comparing the results to your previous work with a pure adaptive sampling, uh, the results look fantastic. You have constantly better frame rates and, and much more it's much more resilient to uh, changes in lighting. Uh, one thing I was wondering about was there's no example that I could see at least where you have perfectly static lighting. And I would have liked to see that just to see what the performance it is in, in that case when your algorithm isn't really needed. Um, so, so my question is just how much of a difference is there? Uh, so for static lighting part, it's uh, the previous paper uh, all talked about static uh, lighting and uh, overall in the test using max the digital human with max uh, demo in UE4 and uh, the acceleration could uh, for real time adaptive sampling, it's around three to four times uh, faster uh, them without using uh, adaptive sampling. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, um, if without the real, uh, the adaptive sampling, it's running like uh, three or four times slower than the separable model. So which is yeah. used quite a lot uh, in real time um, games. So with the adaptive sampling uh, method when it's static, so the performance is comparable to separable. And uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, better, but sometimes it's uh, slower, but a little bit, yeah. Okay, that's pretty much what I expected. So thank you, great. Um, so let's see, moving on to Xavier. Um, so this was the very interesting paper on glint anti-aliasing. Um, yeah, actually, a first question, this might be more about your previous paper, but I want to know. So it wasn't entirely clear to me how you choose your different marginal distributions depending on where on the surface uh, you are. Do you see what I mean? You choose them randomly, but there must yeah. be some... There must be some... Um, spatial... Uh, I mean, they have to change smoothly somehow. Yeah. We need to, uh, uh, to introduce some uh, special variation uh, for the distribution of normals, and um, we uh, we the surface is a partition into cells, and we have a, a MIP hierarchy, and uh, in uh, uh, each cells uh, have. Uh, a coordinate and we use this coordinate to seed uh, the random number generator and uh, uh, we uh, pick a two uh, uh, we pick a, a distribution uh, using uh, the cell coordinates so uh, we can have uh, 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 coherences uh, using uh, the, the cell of the coordinate Okay, I think I understand. So that means, so when you move from one cell to another, does that, is, is that a smooth transition automatically or how does that work? Inside, inside the pixel, uh, we have uh, several cells uh, because we use oh, okay. the same algorithm as a uh, MIP, uh, MIP map filtering. So we have uh, uh, several cells and we, uh, blend the distribution uh, into the pixels so we we have a smooth transitions uh, between okay yeah then i get it great uh thanks and then um 
Leonardo. Um, let's see. Also, very nice work. Um, so it's 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 really smart to use this stochastic. You take the the depth map from stochastic transparency and you use that for uh, ambient occlusion. That's brilliant. Um, I was wondering. Th this means that the closer fragments will be if you have two layers that are occluding a point then the closer fragments will be more prevalent in the depth map if i get this correctly does that does that bias or affect the result or is that or can you um, alleviate that somehow or yeah. is it not so, that so in in our tests it, it didn't show really a bias so we do depth testing but you can obviously also not do depth testing, right? And then you would randomly get uh, any sort of a more uniform distribution of samples, right? By activating mm -hmm. the depth test, what you do is, is you buy a sort of, you, you force uh, the fragments to, to be closer to the camera. Uh, so this can also have negative consequences, right? So if, if there are many layers before the layer that you want, and you activate the step test, then that means there's less chance that you will see the layers that are behind. And mm. so um, that will, um, in, in some geometric configurations, it may be uh, problematic, but in general, and in all the things that we tested, this has not been a problem and it actually improves a little bit uh, having depth test activated so that you uh, make sure that this uh, fragments correspond to the, uh, first layers, it actually improves uh, the the result. Yes, and intuitively, it it sort of makes sense that you're most interested in because ambient occlusion is a fairly local effect. So you're mostly interested in the stuff that you actually see. It just struck me now that if you had a hundred layers and you happen to only pick the ones that you can't see way off in the distance, that wouldn't be good at all. Yes, uh, so, exactly. it, so it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Now we'll take some questions from the audience. So this one is from Adrian Grusen. Um, and he writes, if I understand, this is for the uh, control variate subsurface scattering. If I understand correctly, you propose two versions of your algorithm, one with co uh, control variate coefficient estimated alpha star, and one with constant control variate where alpha star is one. In what scenario do you think the constants, no, in what scenario you think constant CV and what is the drawback of using this simpler formulation? And then I think there's a different, different question after that. Okay, uh, actually this is a very good question. And so, when you want uh, this is a situation that you wanted to use uh, constant control variance, it's in real time render engines. So where the uh, memory is limited, uh, because if you use the uh, uh, the online control variance method, you you need to maintain another texture in memory to do uh, in order to make it work. So with the with the constant. It's like you only need to change the code in the line, uh, in the shader, and then it works. And uh, it works most for flat uh, landing regions. And these drawbacks, yeah, because you do not uh, record those uh, 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 parameters, you cannot get the optimal contrast coefficient, which means under some circumstances, you cannot get the minimal sample count for some region. And if you want to learn more and you can come to the live demo tomorrow and uh, I, I can show it. And yeah, I think that's uh, the answer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll jump around a bit now. So now we've got Ulf Assarsson asks uh, about the stochastic depth ambient occlusion. How would the ambient occlusion technique work for with, for instance, temporal reprojection, which is common in games. Uh, looks like it would be straightforward. 
And I guess that's a question. Would would it be straightforward? Uh, yes, because in the process of of, of creating uh, of of computing this stochastic ambiguity, besides the stochastic depth map, there's also uh, a normal depth map that is computed. Right, you need that in order to know for which point to compute ambiguity. And with the normal depth map, plus if you keep the last frames. Uh, I mean, occlusion value, then you can just reproject the I mean, occlusion value, and that's it. I would not keep the last frames stochastic uh, depth map, uh, mainly because it, it, if, since it, this is a multi sample texture, it, it's quite a bit of memory to keep around. Uh, but I, as you said, it should be straightforward to implement. We haven't done it in our, in our work. All right. Well, that's an interesting uh, future thing you could try. So to um, to be fair, let's move over to Xavier. And I've got a couple of more uh, questions for all of you. They're going to have to stop me when we're running out of time. Um, yes, um, I was. this is just something I was curious about. You use. A, a pyramid MIP map to do your very nice filtering of these slope function things. Um, and, but, and that's going to be a box filter and it's going to be smaller and smaller. So it's going to be linearly interpolated when it gets high. Would it make sense, since in the paper, I think you used a Gaussian filter to show that this works fine. Would it make sense to do a Gaussian blur um, of these things at full resolution, so not have a pyramid map map, but all of them same resolution, and do a Gaussian blur, just to get some slightly better quality. Or would that not make sense at all, or would it not help enough? Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, can we uh, uh, filter the distribution in uh, another way? And. Uh, and I don't know. I, um, I, I, I use uh, the box filter to generate the MIP uh, hierarchy. And I mm -hmm. uh, don't know uh, if it's a good idea to, to change the filter function to, to filter the distribution. Uh, I, it's the first time I think about it. Okay. So, yeah, no, I was just curious if, if there was any, if anything is lost in this uh, simple box filter, or maybe it's just, it's good enough anyways, it's not going to make any difference. It's good enough, I think, uh, to mm -hmm. the purpose of, of the paper. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll go on then. We'll move up to Chen Chen again, uh, and there was a continuing on this uh, question. Oh yes, um, Adrian Grusen again was asking, in your example, there is one main light source, am I correct? Does your technique handle multiple light sources? Mm, yes, for for some sim, there is one main light, uh, like the, uh, the one with Petika, it's just one light. Uh, for the others, like the regular lighting and uh, the teaser, and actually, if you see the candle, it has three lines. They are all moving, and um, th this algorithm can handle some kind of multiple light source. Uh, uh, the drawback is if those li lines, the intensity of all lines changes uh, irregularly. There's no re uh, no patterns inside, and then it's it's impossible to uh, reduce the sample count in uh, like shadow region uh, at the age of shadows. But for the flight landing and the hard shadow region, it's like it can handle it perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Now I have to remember which order we're doing this in. And I don't, but I think we'll take Leonardo and we have a question from. Ducky Lin. Um, any idea 
to get rid of temporal flickering in low sample count. Is it possible to somehow filter the multi-sample depth buffer to make it temporally stable? Um, so let's take the first part first. How to uh, get rid of the temporal flickering? Uh, well, there's two ways. There's the smart way, uh, which is what Ulf said, uh, doing some sort of temporal anti-aliasing uh, technique. Uh, there's also the brute force way, which would be to um, increase the amount of samples. This is a multi-sample texture, the, the stochastic depth buffer. So you can just increase the amount of samples that you have there. Uh, and that will ensure or make it more likely that you find the, the fragments that, that lead to the ambient occlusion that you want to find. Uh, you can also, of course, depending on the specific amine occlusion algorithm that you use. Uh, for example, in horizon-based amine occlusion, you can just take more directions or more samples along a direction. Um, regarding the, um, uh, to fil uh, regarding filtering the multi-sample depth buffer uh, to make it temporarily stable, uh, you could think of, of uh, um, doing some sort of, uh, trying to, to do some sort of trick so that um, you ensure some hashing, using some hashing function so that you ensure that, that within some section of space, uh, fragments uh, are discarded or not uh, in, in a sort of stable way. Um, such that it doesn't matter if you move around or, or what uh, camera position that you have, you, you ensure that you sort of end up with the same uh, layers in the scene so that when you move around, there's not so much flickering. Um, but uh, to be honest, we, we also haven't tried that yet. So this is sort of uh, future work. So it's a nice question. Sure, yeah. Just struck me now very quickly. So for, for stochastic transparency, you have the same surface appearing many times in the uh, multi-sampled depth buffer. Would it be possible, since you don't need that for your algorithm, would it be possible to somehow uh, only allow each surface to appear once? Um, yes. Uh, so so you can do that in, in the way that, that you discard fragments. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you could uh, force that only for, for a single fragment, it's only going to be stored in one single um, of the samples from the multi-sampled texture. The problem there is that since we are using this step testing, right, then, then some other fragment may come along and, and yeah. override it. So it's hard. So then you would need to, at every point, right? Analyze what is there in the fragment buffer and decide uh, in the, yeah, in the, the stochastic depth buffer and decide whether you want to uh, overwrite it or not. Um, and probably it is possible, but it would be slow. Uh, so yeah, we'll go in the direction. Okay. Um, I think I've gotten answers to most of the things I wanted to know, and I think we're out of questions from the audience. Um, did anyone see one that I missed? No. But then I would encourage the audience to, uh, if you have any more questions or you want to discuss anything else, continue doing that on the Discord channel. Uh, all of the authors will, will be there and see your questions. Uh, and thank you for a very nice session. Great papers, everyone. Thanks for watching. Okay, welcome all to the second paper session of I3D.
This session is about rendering and you will enjoy four high quality presentation on various topics from hash function, detecting bias, computing visibility, and how to render participate media interactively. The first paper of this session will be hash function for GPU Park by Mark Gesenki and Mark Olano, both from University of Maryland, Baltimore County. This work has been published in the Journal of Computer Graphics Techniques. The presenter will be Mark Jarzanki. is the technical director of the Image Imaging Research Center at UMBC, is where he works on a variety of projects involving virtual reality, augmented reality, photogrammetry, data visualization, mobile apps, website, and everything in between. He's currently pursuing a PhD in computer science at UMBC at UMBC. The second paper of this session will be detecting bias in Monte Carlo renderers using WESH t-test by Aisha Young, Johanna Sanika, and Kasten Darksbacher, all from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. This work also has been published in the Journal of Computer Graphics Techniques. The presenter will be Aisha Young, a PhD student supervised by Professor Darksbacher, before starting her PhD, she completed a master program at Cornell University. And her research focuses on spectral and spatial space spatial regularization, spectral rendering, and fluorescence. The third paper of this session is Guided Visibility Plus Plus by Thomas, Thomas Carhart and Michael Wimmer, both from the Technical University of Vienna. Thomas Carhart completed his Master of Science degree at this university earlier this year. His thesis resulted in the paper being presented here. And the last paper of this session is Interactive Path Tracing and Reconstruction of Sparse Volume by Nicola Hoffman, John Hassel Diem, Patrick Karlberg, Jacob Muckberg, all from NVIDIA. It is Nicola Hoffman that will do the presentation is currently a PhD student under the supervision of Mark Starminger at the Frederick, Frederick Alexander University in Erlangen, Nuremberg in Germany. His research mostly, mostly concerns GPU path tracing and image denoising with deep learning. The work he presents here is a result of his internship at NVIDIA's real-time rendering research group. And finally, let me introduce myself. I'm Adrian Guzman, a postdoc researcher at McGill University working with direct neurosy. So this concludes my introduction. Now we will play the recorded presentation of, of these four great paper. And then we will have a Q&A session here on this stream. So please post your question on Discord or, and, or, and on YouTube. Thanks for your attention and enjoy the presentation. Hello, my name is Mark Jerzynski from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I'm presenting our paper, Hash Functions for GPU Rendering, where we analyze the quality and runtime performance of several different hash functions for GPU rendering and compare the results. Traditional pseudo-random number generators generate numbers in a sequence. They typically start with some seed and then reuse the result as the input or seed for the next generate number. They're designed with a goal in mind to make a sequence of numbers appear as indistinguishable as possible from a truly random process. However, in GPU rendering, it is desirable to generate random numbers in parallel, rather than a sequential process with a single seed, we typically use a parallel process and use neighboring seeds such as the pixel location, texture coordinate, 3D position, or object ID. When done so, traditional pseudo-random number generators, so the results are not so great. Pictured here are the results from the same pseudo-random number generator. The one on the left uses a sequential process where the previous result from one pixel is used as the seed for the next pixel, while the one on the right uses a parallel process where the two-dimensional XY pixel location is used as the seed. As we can see, changing from a sequential process to a parallel one with the pixel locations as the seed greatly affects the quality of the hash function. The design constraint for traditional pseudo-random number generators and one that will be used for GPU rendering are different. 
Hashing algorithms are used in many places from cryptography to data structures. In cryptography, they're meant to keep information secure, while in data structures, they're generally meant to reduce the retrieval time of the data stored within them. In both scenarios, it can be used to generate seemingly random output from structured input. Cryptographic hash functions have great quality, even when used with neighboring seeds. However, since they're designed with the goal in mind to keep information secure, and thus to make it hard to brute force attack, they end up being slow. Thus, they may not be fast enough for most real-time rendering applications. However, cryptographic hash functions could be desirable in offline rendering techniques where higher quality is desired above all else, and the runtime performance isn't a concern at all. In order to increase the runtime performance of some cryptographic hash functions, one could reduce the number of rounds the hash function executes. For example, in T, or the tiny encryption algorithm, one could reduce the number of rounds from 32 to 5, without much loss in quality. However, this is still comparatively so to other hash functions. Contrary to cryptographic hash functions, data structure hash functions are fast. However, since data structure hash functions are generally meant to store or retrieve data as efficiently or fast as possible, they're designed to avoid collisions and are not exactly designed with randomness in mind. This means that they're likely to fail several tests just as the birthday problem test. While this image may visually appear random, a deeper analysis will reveal multiple failures. Their design and intended use case does not necessarily give them great random quality. So can we do better? Let's figure out what an ideal hash function for GPU rendering will look like. First, it will be deterministic, as in it would have the same output given the same seed. You wouldn't want your resulting image to change if the seed didn't. Second, it would be fast, so that it could be used in real-time applications, or to at least keep offline render techniques as quick as possible. It should also have a consistent and predictable performance. Third, it should be high quality and appear as indistinguishable as possible from a truly random process. Third, it shouldn't have any memory requirements or depend on previous results. We wouldn't want it to cause frames to take longer than others because it had to do slow memory fetches. First, we gather a list of pseudo-random number generators, hash functions, and their variations to test. We focused on finding hash functions that were used in GPU rendering techniques. Then we analyzed their quality with using neighboring seeds as well as runtime performance and graphed the results. In order to analyze the quality, we use an existing randomness quality test suite. Several different of these test suites exist to test the quality of random number generators. These include Die Hard and Die Harder, the NIST statistical test suite, Proctran, and Test201. We chose to use Test201 and its Big Crush battery test because we're able to adapt it to run all of its tests simultaneously on UMBC's high performance computing cluster. This made it possible to get results in a timely manner. Since these tests required 1D input, in order to test higher dimensional hash functions, we use Morton ordering or Z ordering to reduce higher dimensions down to a single dimension. In this diagram, you can see how Morton ordering in two dimensions can be reduced into one dimension by following the lines. This can also be expanded into third and fourth dimensions. This method would still catch translational correlations any dimension, but may not catch correlations between axes. We count how many tests that have each hash passed and use it as a measurement for quality. To test the runtime performance, we use Unreal Engine. We created a scene that only contained a screen filling quad and centered a material and created a material for each hash. We then iteratively applied the material to each of the to the quad and used Unreal Engine's profile GPU tool to capture the per frame runtime performance. In order to isolate the timings for the hash, it is possible to create a unique profile category such that it will appear separate in this list. However, we decided to just mark the material as translucent, which put it in the translucency category. Since this was the only thing marked as translucent within the scene, it was isolated from the rest of the timings. This method did not require any further engine changes to isolate the timings. In order to get measured results, we performed 10,000 chain calls to the hash, and then we recorded the median of five runs. This was done because the profile GPU tool measures them within milliseconds, and it was just the number of calls required to push the fastest the hashes into that range. All tests were performed on the same Windows PC with an NVIDIA GeForce 1080 GPU at 1280 by 720 resolution. In order to figure out which hashes were the best in their class, we needed a method that could compare them across two attributes. 
One method to do so is to graph it and draw as what is called a Pareto frontier. A Pareto frontier is a situation where no individual attribute can be better off without making another attribute worse. Take this graph for example. In this situation, both axes will be considered better closer to zero. Thus, the red dots represent items on the Pareto frontier because you cannot pick an item that has a better attribute in one direction or close, closer to zero without making the other attribute worse in another direction. This is illustrated by not being any dots within the gray box, otherwise there would have been something better in that third, than that third red dot, and thus the Pareto frontier would have connected to that instead. We tested over 130 variations of hash functions, and this is the resulting graph with the Pareto frontier. The y-axis represents the number of test u1 big crush tests failed, lower is better. The x-axis represents the time it takes to execute a single call to the hash function. Again, faster or to the left is better. The labeled hashes, also marked with red dots, are the ones that fell along the Pareto frontier and have the best performance for their quality class. Please see our paper and supplementary for more detailed results, graphs, tables, and deeper analysis. Now we'll go through the few hash functions that fell along the Pareto frontier. The first and fastest is LCG or Linear Congruential Generator. It was the fastest but has horrible quality. You can clearly see gradients and repeating patterns in the resulting image. We would only recommend this hash function if you needed the fastest possible hash and did not care at all about quality. Trig is interesting because it's fast and uses the floating point and uses just floating point operations for input and output. Unfortunately, it uses sign functions, which gives it mixed results across different platforms. You can see repeating patterns in the resulting image. O'Neill's permuted congruential generator (PCG) is an LCG with a permuted mixing stage. It has 1D input and output. While the resulting image looks random and it's hard to visually detect any patterns. A deeper analysis with test u1 shows that it failed several tests. PCG3D is a variation of PCG first introduced into Unreal Engine by co-author Marco Lano. It was inspired by PCG, but with more GPU hardware friendly mixing. It has 3D input and output, which makes a great choice for using 3D world position as a seed. It passed all but one test u1 big crush test. PCG40 is a version of PCG3D but with 4D input and output. It is the fastest hash to not fail any test u1 big crush test. In conclusion, the methods presented here can be used to evaluate hash functions for speed as well as quality, which in turn can be used to make informed decisions on which hash function fits best. Whether or not it's better to have a hash, very hash fast function, the highest quality hash function, or something in between, these methods can hopefully help you make the right choice. In future work, we like to see the development of random number generator test suites with native multi-dimensional support in mind. Rather than trying to adapt existing one-dimensional test suites to such needs, such a test suite could be more likely to notice problems in multi-dimensional hash functions. There are very few hash functions designed natively with multi-dimensional input and output. Work on a constructing one that falls within mid-range could be very useful. And here are some extra goodies where you can find our paper, results, sample images, and shader source code for all the hash functions we tested. And here's a link to the shader toy with visualizations of all the hash functions. Thanks to UMBC's Imaging Research Center for equipment and support. Thanks to UMBC's high performance computing facility for access to parallel cluster, which made the randomness testing fast enough to even be possible to do. And thanks to Epic Games, where work on the hash functions initially started with co-author Marco Lano, as well as funding support for the final analysis and work done at UMBC. And thank you for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Elisa and in this video you can learn about a statistical test called Welk's t-test and how you can apply to detect bias in your Monte Carlo renderers. Imagine this, you have a new path tracer and you know it's correct but it's also super slow and noisy and takes days to convert. So you write a new renderer, which gives you clean images much faster, but you're just not quite sure it's correct. So of course you could compare it to a reference image, which again would take forever to compute, or you could use Welk's t-test. Welk's t-test is a statistical test that compares a new renderer against a reference renderer based on a couple of samples, 
and tells us whether the two renderers will eventually converge to the same result. Pretty often it can do so with only a handful of samples from both the new renderer and the reference, so you don't even need to wait for a fully converged reference anymore. But before we get to the test, I'd like to take a quick recap of Monte Carlo rendering and how we can already detect bias. So Monte Carlo rendering solves the rendering integral by drawing some samples from some distribution and averaging them together. And this works because the expected value of the sum is equal to the integral itself. So with more and more samples, the sum, and thus the renderer, converges to the correct value. Now whenever the renderer is broken, for example because of bugs in the code or the underlying theory, the expected value of the renderer is no longer equal to the correct value, and we call this bias. We usually detect bias by comparing the output of a renderer against the output of a reference implementation. And sometimes such bias can be obvious, but sometimes it's not. For example, potential bias can be hidden behind noise whenever the error caused by bias is much lower than the error caused by variance. For example, if your reference is a super slow and noisy path tracer. Or the bias can be too subtle to be obvious even in a converged image and may not even be noticeable in a difference image. A more objective method is analyzing the behavior of the root mean squared error as we accumulate more and more samples. The idea behind this is that if we plot the RMSE of the output of an unbiased renderer over samples per pixel with logarithmic axes, we get a straight line. So whenever the line starts curving, as in this example at around a thousand samples per pixel, this means that the tested renderer will not converge to the reference image. And this could mean that the tested renderer has bias, but it could also mean that the reference is not sufficiently converged. Instead of using the output images to detect bias, we can also use the samples. And for that, let's go back to this first equation and take a closer look at this sum that Monte Carlo rendering computes. Because we can also interpret this as estimating the mean of the underlying distribution of sample contributions f over p. Also, please note that this distribution is not the same as the distribution p from which we draw the Monte Carlo samples. And in this context, having an unbiased renderer means that the mean of the underlying distribution of f over p is equal to the rendering integral. And in terms of testing against a reference implementation, this means that a renderer is unbiased if the mean of its underlying distribution, or in other words the mean of f over p, is equal to the mean of the reference renderer's underlying distribution, which basically means that the two renderers converge to the same result. And lucky for us, there's a test for just that, which is Welk's t-test, with a tiny restriction that this test only works for normal distributions, but more on that later. Welk's t-test takes two sample sets of possibly different sizes n1 and n2, drawn from two normal distributions with possibly different standard deviation and possibly different mean, and it then computes some statistics on these samples and tests the hypothesis that the means of the underlying distributions are equal. The output of the test, called a p-value, then gives us some confidence about this hypothesis. The way this works is that we start with the two sample sets, and for each set we compute the sample mean by averaging the sample values, and the sample variance by taking the differences of the sample values to the sample mean, squaring them, and normalizing the sum. Then we compute the t-statistic by combining the sample means, sample variances, and the sizes of the sample sets. Since the t-statistic is computed based on two random sample sets, it is a random variable itself, which follows a certain distribution called the t-distribution, if the means of the underlying normal distributions are equal. And the formula for the t-distribution is a bit long, you can look that up in the paper, but it is basically similar to a Gaussian shape. Now, the essential insight of this test is that, given the assumption that the underlying means are equal, we can now compute the probability that we actually measure samples leading to a t-statistic such as the one that we observed. And this probability is called a p-value, and we get it by integrating the t-distribution from t outward. The intuition behind this is that if the t-statistic is close to zero and thus the p-value is big, that means that, assuming that the underlying means are equal, it was actually very likely to measure a t-statistic such as the one that we observed, and we didn't find any evidence to contradict the hypothesis. 
On the other hand, a t-statistic far out results in a low p-value, and this means that, again, based on the hypothesis that the underlying means are equal, it is actually very unlikely to measure sample sets that result in such a large t-statistic. So maybe the hypothesis is not true after all. The problem now is, unlikely does not mean impossible. If we conduct the test enough times, the p-value is actually uniformly distributed. And this means that a single small p-value by itself does not yet prove that the means are different. We circumvent this by not performing a single test, but by breaking up the image into square pixel blocks and performing a separate test within each block. And we can then analyze all these p-values collectively to get a more conclusive result. So, how do we do that? First, we need to consider that the input samples for our XT-test have to be normal distributed, but the contributions sampled by Monte Carlo renderers are typically not normal distributed, so we first have to somehow transform them to roughly normal distributed samples. To do that, we rely on the central limit theorem, which states that the properly normalized sum of an increasing number of samples from some arbitrary distribution tends to be normal distributed. Now, of course, we can't have infinitely many samples, but we can at least approximate this by summing up a finite amount of Monte Carlo samples, and as long as we use the same number of samples for each of the sums, we can also drop the scaling and the shift. In practice, we render the whole image with one sample per pixel, split the image up into disjoint pixel blocks, and then sum up all the Monte Carlo sample values from the pixels within one block to get one sample for Velg's t-test within that block. Then we repeat that, render the next sample per pixel iteration, again sum up all the next set of samples within the block to get the next sample for Velg's t-test, and if we keep doing that, we do indeed get samples that are approximately normal distributed and resemble this fitted Gaussian line. This means that we already need to prepare the samples for Welk's t-test during rendering. So while we render, we write out two frame buffers, one with the sample sums for each pixel block and one with the sum of squared block sums per block, which we will need for the sample variance later. And we do this for both the new renderer and the reference renderer. Once rendering has finished, we give these frame buffers to Welk's t-test, which then performs a separate test for each pixel block and for each color channel within each block which gives us three p-values per pixel block, one for each color channel. And running all these tests takes about the fraction of a second. So, now that the test is done, we can analyze the output. In the paper, we propose two visualizations for that. First, we can simply visualize the resulting p-values in each pixel block, and second, we can collect all the p-values from all the blocks and color channels and throw them in a single histogram, which tells us something about the collective behavior of the p-values. If we want to visualize the values per pixel block, we need to decide whether we want to show the values from all three color channels, as you can see on the left, or if we want to show only one value per block, as you can see in the middle. And in both cases, you can already see a yellow blot to the lower left, which means that there are a bunch of p-values close to zero in this particular area, so there the means of the underlying distributions of the renderers may not be equal, which means that they may not converge to the same result and one of them might be biased. We can also give a higher resolution to such low p-values, for example by visualizing the square root, or by scaling the p-value by some factor and clamping it one. And this confirms our suspicion that the p-values to the lower left are particularly small. The second visualization is a histogram of all p-values, and the idea behind this is that if the renderers have the same mean and converge to the same result, the p-value is uniformly distributed in each of the pixel blocks. So if a histogram of these values is obviously not uniform, the renderers probably do not have the same mean and thus at least one of them is biased. This is also the case in this example where there are a lot more p-values close to zero than we would expect from a truly uniform distribution. Also, please note that this argument does not work the other way around. A uniform histogram does not necessarily indicate that the individual p-values are uniformly distributed, nor does it prove that there is no bias. Okay, so finally, let's take a look at a couple of examples of Welk's t-test in action. I'd like to start with an example for what you can expect if you apply the test to two unbiased renderers. 
And in this example, the camera looks at the corner of an empty gray Cornell box and we tested an unbiased path tracer against itself with different random numbers, once with 10 samples per pixel from both instances and once with 1000 samples per pixels each. And in both cases, we can observe a fairly homogeneous mix of p-values in the block color visualization and the histograms are roughly uniform. Plus, the mean of all p-values shown as a red triangle is basically 0 0.5. And again, this shows that a couple of small p-values are actually expected if we perform the test this many times. What matters is the distribution of p-values, so whether there are clumps in the color block image or non-uniform histogram. Next, I'd like to show you two examples where Welk's t-test successfully detects bias. In this example, we use the same scene as before, again rendered with an unbiased path tracer at 10 samples per pixel, but in this case we use a slightly darker material for the reference render. And in this example, the difference image is still dominated by noise and the color block image is still fairly homogeneous. However, the histogram, both with 10 and with 30 bins, shows significantly more p-values close to zero. Also, the p-value mean in red is slightly smaller than 0 0.5, so taken together, this indicates that the renderers do not converge to the same result, which of course they don't, since they are based on different materials. In this example, we use the same scene for both renderers, but once we use an unbiased path tracer and once a path tracer with a slightly biased MAS weight. And the error caused by this is very subtle, so the difference image does not pick it up at all, and even for the histogram we need at least a couple thousand samples per pixel from both the reference and the biased renderer to confirm a non-uniform p-value distribution. However, this is not actually too bad when we compare it to the RMSE plot, since the plot doesn't even reveal any bias, at least for the first few thousand samples per pixel. Also, please keep in mind that for Welk's t-test we used the same sample count for both the reference and the tested renderer, while for a proper RMSE plot we would need many more samples for the reference. In this last example, I'd like to highlight what happens if the input to Welk's t-test is too far from a normal distribution. To test this, we added a glass sphere to our simple test scene, which introduces a lot more variance. So if we now look at the histogram of sample sums from the top right pixel block and a fitted Gaussian line, we can see that because of the higher variance in the individual samples, the distribution of these block sample sums is too different from a normal distribution. And what this means for the test is that if we test the unbiased path tracer against itself, the color block image still looks fairly homogeneous, maybe a little bit more yellow than before, but the histogram is actually strongly skewed towards small p-values. So in this case, Welk's t-test thinks the two renderers will converge to different images simply because the input is not normal distributed anymore. To conclude this, Welk's t-test can help you figure out if a renderer is biased or not, although it will not tell you how bad the bias actually is or tell you anything about the performance or image quality. Since it is a statistical test based on random inputs, there is always some uncertainty in the output and the result is not a definite proof of bias or unbiasedness, although we somewhat alleviate that by performing separate tests in multiple pixel blocks. Also, the test produces false negatives if the input is not roughly normal distributed. With that being said, I still believe that there is a place for this test, because the p-value histogram can reveal bias much faster than, for example, an RMSE plot, both with fewer samples from the renderer and also with a less converged reference. And showing the p-values per pixel block can hint at suspicious image regions, which in turn may help you locate the underlying error. So thank you so much for listening and I hope that this test will be useful to some of you whenever you want to develop a new Monte Carlo renderer offline or real time and simply want to make sure it's correct. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Thomas Koch and I'm going to present our work Guided Visibility Sampling++. We want to solve the following problem. Given a region in space called the fuel cell, we want to determine the objects that are visible from any point on the fuel cell. An exact solution is called the exact visible set, EVS short. This set contains all of the objects that are visible. Practically, however, the EVS is approximated and the result is a potentially visible set, or short PVS. Aggressive algorithms underestimate the EVS. This means that 
the PBS can miss objects. Conservative algorithms overestimate the EVS and this means that the resulting PBS can contain redundant objects. On the other hand, approximative algorithms can miss objects but can also contain redundant objects. Now there's a whole range of different methods for computing such a visibility solution. Exact methods often use line space and Plücker coordinates and also portals. Approximative methods use portals and ray casting. Conservative methods often use the concept of occluder fusion and recently the concept of a camera offset space has been introduced. Aggressive methods often use ray casting and rasterization. Rasterization methods are prone to miss subpixel triangles and ray casting methods are typically rather slow. One state of the art technique that uses ray casting is called guided visibility sampling by one kind colleagues. So here ray casting is used to efficiently build a PBS, but it is still rather slow. So it can take up to multiple seconds for simple scenes. Since this technique delivers good results and due to the recent developments in hardware accelerated ray tracing, such as RTX and APIs such as Vulkan, we have revisited this method. And our goals were to improve the accuracy of the used sampling strategies and to optimize this algorithm for parallelization on the GPU. And for this, we are leveraging hardware accelerated ray tracing. And the result is a new method called Guided Visibility Sampling++. I'll first show GVS and its shortcoming and then our approach. So the idea is that you start with random sampling the scene and then combine intelligent sampling strategies such as ABS to find neighbor triangles and reverse sampling to handle discontinuities that are encountered. Both algorithms have been improved in our new approach. We start with random sampling. Here we have a region in space that's again our view cell and from this we want to compute the PBS. So we start with random sampling the scene from randomly distributed points on the view cell and here we intersect one triangle. After that, we use adaptive border sampling to find neighbors. Now the idea is to sample along the borders of this found triangle. And for this, a border polygon with nine vertices is constructed. Next, those vertices are sampled. Let's say we sample X0 and X1. Now if sampling two adjacent vertices like X0 and X1 here does not intersect the same triangle, then the edge between x0 and x1 is further sampled. That's the case here. And this edge subsampling continues in a recursive manner. And one problem is that this recursive sampling does not parallelize well on the GPU because those positions are calculated on the fly and therefore you can't sample the border in parallel. Also, this may easily miss triangles, especially in a case where the border is not further sampled like here. So such a triangle may be missed. Now in our approach, we have an improved adaptive border sampling method that addresses those problems. So we replaced the recursive sampling by a much simpler approach by fixed sample positions. But this also offers better parallelizability. So here we start with constructing a border polygon again, and then those vertices are sampled in parallel. The second sampling strategy that is used is called reverse sampling. And with this, discontinuities that are encountered during the adaptive border sampling are handled. So first, the discontinuity is encountered. And this is because we sample X target from X origin, but here we hit a closer occluding triangle. Now the idea is to find a different ray origin on the view cell, such that we can shoot past this occluding triangle. The idea is that new points just outside of the occluding triangle are constructed. And then lines through those points are intersected with the view cell and checked if they intersect the view cell at all. If there is an intersection, then this new point is called X mutated. And from this point, X target is sampled and the occluding triangle is passed. Now there are some problems with this approach. The first problem is that both lines through the samples can miss the view cell. Second problem is that a discontinuity, when no triangle is intersected, is not handled at all. This is illustrated here. As one is sampled from X origin, no triangle is intersected. This is a discontinuity. 
However, sampling S1 from a different point on the fuse cell could find further triangles. This is not handled. In our new reverse sampling algorithm, we address both of those problems and you will now see our new approach. So here is the first discontinuity then that we can handle and also we handle discontinuities where no triangle is intersected. I'm now going to focus on the first case because the handling is rather similar. So there's now a discontinuity. The idea is now that we project the occluding triangle from the X target point onto our fuse cell. And we now know all of the positions on the fuse cell from which we can sample X target without intersecting this occluding triangle. The idea is that we now distribute points on the fuse cell and from these that are outside of the projection, we can now sample the X target point. I now want to get into a few noteworthy points about our implementation. The idea is that we execute the main workload on the GPU. That's all of these sampling tasks. Also, the PBS that stores the triangle IDs is stored and maintained on the GPU. We also store a queue with triangle IDs and ray data in GPU accessible system memory. We first dispatch random sampling. The random sampling is then executed on the GPU. Whenever a triangle is intersected, we check if it is already in the PVS. If not, it's inserted into the PVS and also into the queue. This is a crucial point because the uniqueness of the elements in the PVS and in the queue is already ensured on the GPU. So there's no set, for instance, required on the CPU. Then after that, after the random sampling, we dispatch adaptive border sampling. Adaptive border sampling is then executed for all of those elements in the queue. Now some results. We've used different test scenes, Canyon Power Plant, Germany and Bistro, and those black rectangles are the fuse cells. And the test system contains an RTX 3080. We've measured the pixel error by rendering the whole scene in green and the PBS in red from 2000 points on each fuse cell. We then counted the number of red pixels. And those red pixels are the holes in the PBS. Here you can see the PBS size, the average pixel error, and the maximum pixel error for each scene. Each algorithm had the same time budget for each scene. Here you can see that GVS++ produces the largest PVS, the smallest average pixel error, and also the smallest maximum pixel error. Here we compare GVS++ and GVS on the GPU in more detail. And for this, we have used one representative fuse cell on the power plant scene during the first five seconds of the runtime. Here we see the number of triangles found over the number of traced rays by GVS++ and GVS. First, you can notice a difference in line length. And this is because this is a zoom in on the first five seconds of the runtime of both algorithms. So overall, GVS++ is able to trace 57% more rays within the same time frame. This is due to the better parallelization that is achieved, but more on that later. Here we see the percentage of triangles found per sampling strategy for GVS and GVS++. GVS++ finds about 84% of the triangles with adaptive border sampling and reverse sampling, while GVS relies more heavily on random sampling, discovering about 60% of the triangles with ABS and RS and about 40% with random sampling. Reverse sampling of GVS++ find significantly more triangles than GVS reverse sampling. However, we can also see that both ABS methods find a similar number of triangles. But we have to note that our ABS method offers better parallelizability than that of GVS, and therefore it's able to trace more rays within the same time frame. So here on the left, we can see the rays traced by ABS over its execution time. GVS++ is here in red. While on the right, we see the triangles found over the ABS execution time. The performance uplift through hardware accelerated ray tracing can be seen when comparing against the original CPU implementation of GVS. So here you can see the average pixel error over time, and you can see the very slow convergence of GVS on the CPU. We note that GVS on the GPU is over three orders of magnitude faster than GVS on the CPU and GVS++ is over four orders of magnitude faster than GVS on the CPU. We also found that comparison is difficult because GVS on the CPU is not watertight. So that means that here on the right, 
triangles can be found that are back facing. So future work includes improving the random sampling because this is only good for an initial set of triangles, but inefficient for highly converged stages. You may use important sampling instead that is guided by occlusion in the scene. And also adaptive border sampling, you here may want to vary the number of samples depending on the triangle size. I conclude, we have presented guided visibility sampling plus plus. It's an aggressive from region visibility algorithm and the sampling strategies parallelize well on the GPU. It's four orders of magnitude faster than GPS on the CPU and it offers faster PBS conversions than all of the tested algorithms. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Nikolai and I'm going to talk about our work on interactive path tracing and reconstruction of dynamic sparse volumes. So first of all, what are we trying to achieve here? What are our goals? So we're looking at volume path tracing of high quality and animated assets, such as those that you can see on the right here. And we want to bring renderings of those as far as possible into the interactive domain. Because usually such renderings are, like frame times for such renderings are usually measured in minutes instead of milliseconds. So um, we definitely need to bridge uh, quite a large gap here. And these renderings usually take like multiple thousands of samples to converge. So we definitely need some form of denoising as well. So we also want to look at if we are able to denoise such renderings well and also in a temporally stable fashion. So first of all, I want to <clears throat> talk about why the problem is hard in the first place. So with volume path tracing, if you shoot array into a volume, you then sample for collisions with the volume, such as this, for example, and then connect the ray to a light source. And now you get one bounce of uh, illumination, one bounce of lighting. If you uh, redo that step, um, you might get a totally different result. And that's due to the sampling of collisions being a stochastic process. So the third ray, for example, might actually completely miss the volume. And if we repeat that multiple times, we get different results for each of the samples we traced. So just to integrate direct lighting or single scattering in the volume is considerably harder than for surfaces since none of the rays will hit the same point or um, probably not. So if we now let the rays bounce around the volume more in order to fully integrate uh, GI or multiple scattering, the sampling problem, problem um, increases in complexity drastically. So there's a lot more possibilities um, and a lot more uh, possible light paths than these uh, paths can take. So it's a very complicated integration problem. Um, and on the other hand as well, it actually does make a difference. So all that computational work is not wasted. So if we only integrate single scattering, for example, or direct lighting in this case, where the volume is backlit or the light source is located behind the volume, we do not capture all of the lighting in the scene. And on the other hand, if we let the rays bounce around more, in this case, up to 100 times, actually. Then we capture all of the lighting in the scene. And we get that proper cloudy or fluffy appearance that we, we aim for. And then as well, we need to take care about the integrators we choose. Because, like, for example, if we use a simple ray marcher, uh, even with jittered sap sizes, we might miss some of the fine details of the cloud in this a zoomed example here. Whereas if we rely on unbiased collision trackers, like null collision trackers, um, then we capture, properly capture all the fine details and uh, the, and the contrasts around the, the cloud. So now regarding our system for interactive volume rendering. So there's three main components here. There's the renderer at the, at the core, the volume path tracer. And we also employ a denoising neural network and a sample map estimator network. So the idea is to give ourselves a certain ray budget, in this case, four samples per pixel on average, that you want to trace as fast as possible, and then heavily lean on neural networks to remove residual noise in the, in the renderings or um, improve the sampling as well. So for example, if we trace four samples per pixel, we then get a noisy image, which will be fed into the denoising network, which tries to guesstimate the converged result, which is then the image you'll actually see in the end, which is then fed back into the pipeline into the sample map estimator network, which tries to look at the results and uh, identify problematic regions or high variance regions that are hard to sample. 
and then outputs a sample density map, for example, one, as you can see here, where the edges or the outlines of the volume and the thin parts are um, highlighted. And now for the next frame, the renderer can actually trace more rays into these difficult regions. So I want to look at some of the uh, main components in a little bit more detail. We cannot cover everything here, um, but there is more in the paper if you're interested. And for example, regarding optimizations to our volume path pressure, there, there's one I want to highlight, which is the stochastic interpolation. It's provided the single largest speed up of our optimizations. And the idea here is to get rid of the eight volume lookups for, that's uh, required for trilinear filtering um, and replace it with a single lookup. Uh, we need that sort of filtering because our um, volumes are discrete voxel grids. Um, and if we do not filter, they will have a very uh, blocky uh, structure. Um, very, all of the voxels are visible, so we need some form of filtering. Um, but since they are sparse, we cannot uh, go for hardware trilinear filtering without overhead, um, since it's only supported for dense uh, volumes. So we instead opt for a little stochastic trick that we call stochastic interpolation, where we only do a single lookup, so a nearest neighbor lookup, but we jitter the lookup position by half a voxel size, which you can consider equivalent to important sampling linear interpolation, where, where the filter weight and the PDF cancel out, so there's only this lookup left. And due to Monte Carlo integration, we actually get a filtered result in the end over multiple samples. So we completely replace eight lookups by one and still get the same results. Uh, some other observations, um, multiple important sampling turned out to be quite important for convergence, especially with anisotropic phase. And Russian roulette also helps a lot to map the workload better onto the GPU because we're able to cull some of the long divergent paths, which might increase noise a little bit, but it helps in terms of performance. So now moving on to the denoising part. Denoising in general wants to guesstimate the converged result from a noisy, noisy input. So you can see an example here. And our idea is to reuse as much of the existing state-of-the-art techniques from surface rendering and see how far we can get with those. So the network we use is a hierarchical kernel predicting denoising network with a temporal recurrence loop. So the main part here is that we do not predict the output color directly. So what you see is not the output of the network. Instead, the network outputs filter kernel weights, uh, as you can see here in green, for a full resolution filter, half resolution and quarter resolution. And these are then applied to the noisy inputs, these filters blended together, and that's the result that you can actually see. So another very common approach from surface rendering is to employ feature guides as well. So the um, denoiser, which works in screen space, gets some of the geometric information, for example, via positions, normal, step, but it's not as simple in the volume, unfortunately. Because, as I said before, all of the hit points are stochastic. So if we trace two rays into the exact same, uh, through the exact same pixel in the same direction, we get different results. So we rely on the um, feature guides from the first bounce, but we also compute standard deviation. For example, in, in the density case here, we add the mean in the red channel and the standard deviation in the green channel. Same for depth. And for position, that's also the position of the first bounce, we just average. And we also feed that information to the denoiser, um, which in the surface case usually helps a lot because the, um, these feature maps can serve as edge stoppers for the filters. So you don't blur over edges or discontinuities. But that um, we did observe some form of improvement in all three metrics that we observed, but they're very modest. So that's not the amount of improvement that we expected. So uh, as a conclusion, classic edge stoppers do not seem to be working as well as they do for surfaces in the volume. And we also tried to apply demodulation of the color buffer. So we uh, split the color buffer into high frequent and low frequent information. So we could then predict different filter kernels for 
A, the high frequency uh, buffer, where we want to preserve as much of the fine detail, and another filter kernel for the low frequent information, where we could blur more um, and then blend the results of those two together. But again, we only observed some very minor improvements at a very moderate runtime run cost because we needed to predict and run two filters. So there's definitely some more work to be done in that regard. <clears throat> and since that didn't turn out too great, we uh, um, shifted our focus to a different approach. And we also implemented adaptive sampling. So uh, we instead opted for a small additional unit, a very small unit, as you can see here, which is trained jointly together with the denoising network. And um, it then predicts the normali normalized density sample map. So the renderer will then trace more rays into the um, interesting regions. And then the denoiser has easier work since uh, the difficult regions are sampled better. And that turned out to provide way more um, quality improvement than uh, the feature guides, for example. So we observed that adding adaptive sampling was roughly worth 2x of uniform samples. And um, so that, that turned out way better. But on the other hand, our scene is of rather simple complexity because um, we always use a static background, for example. So just using a naive adaptive sampling helps um, as well. And there's definitely some uh, runtime cost to it as well, since a lot of the samples which would otherwise miss the volume will now be redirected into the volume due to the adaptive sampling. Uh, and we need to trace more rays in the end. So there's definitely some cost, but there's also a very clear performance and quality, uh, quality improvement. So now I want to show you all of our system in, in place. So that's a uh, recording done on a 3090 GPU on 1080p. And it's running at constant 30 milliseconds, 30 FPS. Um, so we support volume animations as well, which we denoise in a temporal stable fashion. We can also adjust some of the volume parameters for, in, in this case, the anisotropy. anisotropy. Um, that's the undenoised input samples that the denoiser will see. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, running at constant frame times and there's uh, some small details of the volumes might be lost, but it's still a very convincing result. And uh, we also import some simple form of emission, as you can see here, um, where again, we can adjust some of the scene's parameters, in this case, the albedo of the volume without any temporal lag or ghosting. That makes, makes for some very uh, acidy looking cloud. And here you can also see the adaptive sample map on the bottom. It uses a slightly different normalization than in the, in the uh, frame shown previously, but it still gives you a, a good indication of where most of the rays will be traced. So here's a small performance breakdown of our multiple scenes that we've tested. Um, so there's the actual volume path tracer in green. There's a denoising network in purple and the adaptive sampling network in blue. Since the neural networks operate in screen space, their overhead is always constant, but the volume renderer is very scene and parameter dependent. As you can see here, the complexity of the scene increases also the the rendering times increase, um, and most of the time is definitely spent on, on volume rate traversal. So that's the main bottleneck here. It's actually the rendering uh, and not the neural networks. So to wrap up, we showed that interactive path tracing of small to medium sized volumetric assets in the GPU is definitely feasible right now, and we can also denoise it, but there's still some challenges that remain. So for example, figuring out the best approach to feature guides and something I didn't touch on right now is reprojection because reprojecting in a volume is way harder than different surfaces as well, which might also solve some of the sharpness that is lost, some of the fine detail that is lost to denoising. And adaptive sampling uh, proved to be very helpful in dealing with some, some of the harder or high variance regions of volumes. And uh, it also needs some further investigation of how to unify 
both surface and volume rendering in a single denoiser because we mainly looked at uh, volume denoising in isolation. And to wrap up, there's a small t-shirt that I want to include now because I, as I said previously, we've been bottlenecked very hard on volume ray traversal. So we spent some more time looking into that and we came up with a simpler data structure and um, some algorithmic sugar as well to in the end gain a 2.5 to 3x speed up with 6.5x reduced memory footprint, um, which will be released in an upcoming article on Ray Tracing Gems 2. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, uh, you can look out for that as well. And with that, I want to conclude and thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Mark Drzezinski from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I'm presenting our paper, Hash Functions for GPU Rendering, where we analyze the quality of- Hey, welcome back for the Q&A session. So thanks, uh, thanks for all the hotel again for preparing this presentation. Please post questions on Discord on, on the YouTube channel. So just before I start the Q&A session, I want to introduce you Michael uh, Wimmer, that is also here for the Q&A session. He's a professor at the Institute of Visual Computing and Human Centered Technology at the, at the Technical University of Vienna. Okay, so let's start with the question. And the first question that I will ask is about the hash function, pa uh, uh, hash function paper by Mark. So P PCG looks great, right? Like uh, it's so tempting to use when you have a uh, Monte Carlo estimator. But so can you comment what is your risk of using it? And what if, for example, if you use a bad, uh, a bad uh, hash function, what, right. what, what artifacts would you, it would produce on the final image? Right, so um, when you make a noise function and you're using the hash underneath, it sometimes the resulting image of the noise function will change based on, well, it will change based on the hash. Mm -hmm. um, but depending on the use case of how you use that noise function, it will change the results. And sometimes when you use a hash function like PCG, um, the resulting noise pattern doesn't look so great. It looks more uniform. Um, if you look in the supplementary of our paper, there's uh, pictures of some just noise functions um, that we made. And in the PCG one, the, we have a brick pattern that looks good. There's like a swirly brain looking ball, mm -hmm. it looks good. But then there's a brick pattern, um, a stone wall pattern, and it looks like there's uh, repeating patterns in that. Um, the PCG function is also only one dimensional. So um, you're gonna wanna probably do, use a two dimensional or three dimensional hash functions for um, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, so you could you can nest, uh, nest it inside each other. Um, so uh, PCG of X and then outside of that PCG of Y um, plus that results um, or X or something like that. And we have the results in there in the paper too. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so my next question is about uh, Welsh T test uh, for Alicia. So first, I want to mention that the code is available. I, I have used it for my own rendering system, so it's really usable. And so, so you mentioned that uh, a uniform distribution of P doesn't um, um, does not imply an uh, unbiased estimator, right? So could you give me some example? when it's happening in practice? Uh... Yes, a uh, good question. So I have not observed this in practice in any of the tests that we ran. So I don't know if this will actually happen. Um, one, like there are two things that I'd like to mention for that. One is that the P values that we have, they don't all come from the same distribution, but each come from it, comes from its own distribution mm, sure. within the pixel block. So if those are different, but if you accumulate them, they end up being uniform. In theory, that would be when you would observe a uniform histogram, mm -hmm. even though if the individuals are not uniform. And one way that might happen is that, I don't know if you remember from the talk, we had one case where the histogram was like this. And in the paper, we also had a case where it was something like this, where we used um, correlated sampling points. So maybe if you have different sources of bias, which result in different histograms that somehow add up to a uniform one, Okay, you might so, observe that. so if you are unlucky, but in practice it seems like it's unlikely that this kind of yes. happening, right? Okay, great. Uh, I, I will. There is a following question about your bias estimation, right? So you can you can detect the bias with the p value, right? Mm -hmm. And there is some techniques that use this this uh, bias estimation for debiasing the resultant of that, right? So do you think 
your techniques, you can apply it for this kind of task, or but like you have on the block of pixels, so you still mm -hmm. need to have quite of a lot of a sample if you want to do it in pixel wise, right? Mm. I don't really think you can use it for this because the test doesn't tell you how much bias you have. It just tells you bias or no bias. And you can get stronger output from the test, but that only says that it's more certain that there is bias, but not that the bias in itself is stronger. Like for example, if you use more samples, the, tech, uh, the test will give you a more certain result, but that doesn't mean there is more bias. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, okay, sure, thanks. Uh, so my next question is about uh, guiding vi uh, visibility sampling plus plus uh, paper. So for Thomas and uh, Michael. So again, like the code is available for this paper. And so like you have modified this algorithm in multiple ways, like the original algorithm to port it on the GPU. Can you tell me what is the most impactful change that you have done in the original algorithm that make like good performance in terms of quality or efficiency. Mm -hmm. So um, making the adaptive border sampling algorithm uh, better parallelize on the GPU gave yeah. the best uh, performance uplift. Mm -hmm. But um, improving the uh, reverse sampling to sample the um, discontinuities much more uh, densely gave uh, much better results and okay yeah. so so actually in one time you get better good performance yeah. but the quality on the other end so it's mm -hmm. okay gotcha okay great uh so my next question is for interactive uh, volumes for nicola uh so I, I think maybe you mentioned during the talk but like what kind of something might do you initially provide for to uh, the volume path tracer before it's refined by the estimator. So I guess it is uh, the map uh, that you use for using your adaptive something step, right? Can you exactly. read that? <clears throat> exactly, yeah. So initially you would want to have a completely neutral map. So um, because there is no guess, no initial guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you to make sure you get that or approximately get that because you never know with networks is you just include some black frames in the training set uh, to make sure it handles like the neutral case as well. Um, but in the end, it also only matters for the first frame because um, in the second frame, it will be refined anyways. Yeah, because you get the information then exactly. back on that. Okay, sure. Uh, okay, great, thanks. So there is another question that was posted. So it is possible to use uh, the, I think, uh, SPVG, so like, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, subsurface scattering, right? Techniques. Uh, Propose that for the adaptive sampling, because like for now you use deep learning for the adaptive sampling because you do training end to end, right? But mm -hmm. can you replace this adaptive sampling state by more traditional approaches that you know track variance and all the stuff like this? And yes, definitely. So it, it, you do only have to feed a map into the the renderer that tells uh, the renderer how many rays to trace. You could mm -hmm. even exceed the four sample average or go below it. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can just replace it by any technique uh, that generates such a map. You could even just apply a random guess. Okay, um, sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I have uh, some question for the ash 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 function. So, like. Did you, in, in your paper, did you provide some uh, new formulation of the hash function? I think so for 4D, right? For PC, P, PCG 4D or not? Yeah, we, uh, we published uh, PCG 3D and PGG 4D. Um, they were previously in Unreal Engine, um, or my co-author, uh, Marco Lano, he, he uh, did that while he was there at Epic. Okay. Um, and how, how did you come with, you know, this new hash function? Because imagine, I, I want to design a hash function for higher, Dimension, right? Or uh, what is? Do you have a global recipe for doing that, or like you know, or, just, <laughs> or yeah, just by expertise of black magic on like this? Uh, yeah, it's it's more trial of an error and um, seeing how it looks. Um, shader tour is a good resource because you could um, have that shader tour and you can see the bit plane visualizations of it, so you can see where each bit falls, um, and you can see how random each bit is. 
um, you should see like a random distribution in each uh, grid cell. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a trial and process. Um, I know the, uh, Alano, he took, um, he, he looked at PCG and then it was using, um, I believe, uh, shifts and XORs and he replaced those with um, uh, mole ads, uh, multiplying ads, so that um, it would be a little more hardware friendly on the GPU. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he, he uh, changed it to be um, uh, multi-dimensional input and output. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, I think we are close to running out of time for, for this session. But so, so thanks again, everybody to be here and have presented your, your work. Uh, for the audience, like, please continue to ask a question on the Discord channel. People, uh, the authors will be here to reply the question offline uh, and uh, thanks again uh, to, to be here and enjoy the rest of the i3D program. See you.